Welcome back this morning. We had an exceptional day yesterday. I was really pleased. Uh, we hadn't done that segment before. It was sort of a new attempt to sort of bring in the world of digital tech and startups to our audience and see if we could paint a picture of what the world is like from their point of view. We started out with the discussions about how to think through, how to be a visionary, how to understand the needs of the world around you, then went into the financing side of it, and finally ended up with what uh, we call the bone tank, this uh, opportunity for us to hear from, and hear from, uh, sorry to hear from, I said twice, uh, the startups um, out there making a difference in the world. Today is a different structure. Today we're gonna uh, focus exclusively on the outpatient surgery space. Uh, it is the theme for this year. And we're going to talk about the opportunities that exist in the outpatient surgery suites. Um, and let me see, I think it may have a slide. Um, Dr. Vail, unfortunately, couldn't make it this morning. But yeah, here we go. So um, we're going to go through the, the trends in the outpatient surgical suite. As you all know, there's a massive move to outpatient surgery in musculoskeletal care. It is definitely going to be driving the next decade's worth of innovation because that is where it needs to happen. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about um, some of the opportunities that we've seen there. We have an amazing keynote. I think you guys will find it uh, really, really helpful because it'll, it, it points out that innovation does not necessarily have to come from within. It can come from outside our industry and then be brought to bear onto our problems and be very, very, very helpful. Um, I once remember going to a conference where um, uh, they made us all sit around and try to build the stacks of um, the tallest buildings we could with blocks, wood blocks. And said, so go look at the rules, and then everybody went around, but one person at each table was considered the CEO, and then there was somebody building. Anyway, the point is, everybody started doing this stuff. And everybody built like eight-inch towers, and except one table had 30-inch towers, and we couldn't figure out why. At some point, the, and then they kept repeating the exercise. After three cycles, about 10 tables were building very tall towers. What had happened was, at the tables where the so-called CEO wasn't paying attention to their team, they were looking at what the other tables were doing, they figured out the clue. The trick is always to stay aware of what's happening around us. That is a big part of what we do at DocSF. So I wanna, there's a fantastic story you're gonna hear from Slim a little later about that. Um, we're going to get into the whole AI conversation, robotics, computer vision, some really amazing companies showing us exactly where we're going. Um, we have these amazing symposia, one from Stryker, one from Think Surgical upstairs at lunch. We'll go up the staircase up there. The lunch will be served there. There's a room if you would rather stay separate from these events, you can. We would like to ask competitive companies not to go to the Stryker or Think events. Uh, that'll be helpful. Um, DocSF Science comes back today and tomorrow. Uh, this is a hugely popular segment. We go through the scientific evidence for change. The greatest, um, uh, Fabrizio, who is here, there he is back there, has gone through hundreds of articles with his team to bring you the best research. We'll be discussing it. Um, we have some really interesting conversation around robotics. Super excited to have Nana here. Nana, raise your hand. Uh, he's going to talk. He's, he's built an ASC in Europe um, as a standalone product, which is phenomenal. Again, let's look outside our world to see what other people are doing to innovate. I love the last two sections here. This section here, we're going to have um, a, a session on blockchain. For those of you who just a little confused about what that means, I think you're going to walk away really excited about that space. Um, and the very last talk um, on this is actually Friday. I got it back. Um, there's a whole section on the um, on um, on uh, payment models, uh, revenue capture, and then a session on the in, um, uh, on the integration layers, which are going to sit between the point solutions we've been hearing about today and our EMRs, which will finally solve that problem of interoperability we've been talking about for decades now. So with that, um, take a deep breath. <sighs> Collectively, um, we have an amazing group of people. One of the things I want you to actually uh, step back. I was really gratified yesterday. We had a full house. 
And a lot of people came up to me afterwards say how much they enjoyed meeting the people here. This is a big part of why we do this live. We did it for several um, iterations virtually. We had 4,700 people online, but this didn't happen. What we do from stage is we seed the conversations. We throw on ideas, you guys talk about them afterwards, and that's really where all the thinking happens. All right, I am now gonna talk for a few minutes about DocSF um, and the evolution of this concept uh, of this conference. Um, so, um, 2015, I am uh, at Kaiser Permanente, and um, I meet with Tad Vale, the chairman of our department, and I say, look, I would love to come. Uh, Kevin Bozik had left to go and start a huge project in Texas, and there was an opening at my alma mater, and I was very, very interested in doing that, but I said, there's two, two things that I, if I come, I need to work on. One is this idea of digital orthopedics. I actually registered that hashtag. It didn't exist in 2015. I had been working in that space for some time in technology, and I saw this huge wave of innovation coming that was going to completely revolutionize how we, um, how we interface with our patients, how we do the work that we do. The other was this concept of kinematic alignment. It's an interesting idea about how we do knee replacements. In and of itself, it's a small thing compared to everything else in the world around us, but for me it was very interesting because as a concept, it challenged the foundation, the keystone of everything we thought was true in the world of knee replacement. It, has, it's, it, it went away from this idea that everybody should be merged to a mean, to an average, to something that is ideal, and instead said there's room for opportunity for um, a broader way to think about the way we should be doing things. It's, it, it fits right into this idea of, um, of, uh, that we do in medicine of, of, oh, the word is escaping me. What is it? Somebody help me. Um, oh, I'll come back to it. Anyway, not one way to do things. And he said, fine, that's great. We're an academic institution. Go for it. So I said, great. Let's move forward. So we spent a year thinking about how to bring digital health to um, conferences. And I've done a lot of conferences for the academy, for other things, and I said, the only way it's gonna work is if we bring together the people that are not talking to each other. If we can actually reach out and get physicians and tech people and venture capitalists and hospital systems to come together in one space. And we said, the only place that actually happens in San Francisco is the JP Morgan conference. So at JP Morgan, we launched the first Doc SF uh, down the street, and it was amazing. The, the conversations that happened were phenomenal. Why? We had four pillars to this concept. One is community. Bring everybody together, the people that don't normally talk to each other, and ask them to sit next to each other. If you get a CEO of a healthcare system sitting next to a venture capitalist, they've never actually talked to each other, but they're wor both working in the same system, and what they bring is a different perspective. We've been talking a lot about AI. We've been talking about large language models. And it's all about training the data set. The truth is, the larger the data set you train your brain on, the broader your thought processes are. So the more people you interface with who come from a completely different place than you do, the, the greater your thought process will be. Then we want to bring the cutting edge technology to our folks. Look, we're in Silicon Valley. Everybody is here. And if the person isn't here who you want to talk to, someone who does a competitive company is so we could bring the technology to it. Third pillar was management. And when I was at Kaiser Permanente for 15 years, I cannot tell you how much money they spent on me as a leader to do leadership training. It was incredibly powerful. You cannot have a shiny new object, drop it into a, into a system, and expect it to work. It, doesn't, it just doesn't. You need to do change management. It turns out this Harvard Business Review um, published an article a few years ago. I read more of that than I do JBJS. 40% um, of any change management project should go to people. Not the technology, not the hardware, not the tech stack, but people management. Or the failure rate goes up to about 90%. So we want to introduce that. And you'll hear it from McKinsey this year that's partnered with us and will bring you a lot of those th that thinking to you. But also the IDEO team that was here yesterday. It always has. And last piece is policy, which is why at the end of Friday we have a whole session 
on uh, RTM codes and uh, value-based care because that is a huge driver of the economy today in healthcare. Put all that together and you get this. This is our first DOCSF in 2020, no, in 2017. This actually was our first faculty dinner at a pizza place down the street. Uh, we, had, we launched the concept of the pink socks. We had companies present on the side, uh, in the rooms on the side, which was really fun. We grow. This is Mark. He was here yesterday. He, um, that was the year he started his own health hub award, uh, process, Dr. Vale. On the side, we started having these meetings on the side with IDEO, a lot of design thinking, really clever ideas, people really connecting, and that's then a spoil on the bottom left. And this uh, got us to the point where we were actually having Matt Wilpers from Peloton come, come uh, run a session with us on calisthenics in the morning. And this is 2020, and we really got, we're really doing well. And we brought great technologies. We introduced, at a time, it was early, this idea of telehealth. Um, people weren't really buying into it. Of course, the following months, because uh, this is January 2020, things changed. We got into all kinds of uh, interesting technologies like meta reality for placement of spinal screws. We, of course, discussed robotics, of course, discussed uh, the use of uh, uh, computer vision and its impact on uh, everything from, uh, for example, this example, which is physical therapy, uh, holograms to help us visualize our complex anatomy. And we've had some companies that were startups here that have gone on to raise a whole lot of money and be extremely successful. Um, and I also present this idea of confluence I like it better than some other terms. Let's see if this works, but the idea here... Hello, uh, this is Sol, yeah, Dr. Great. Beanie's assistant. Hello, Sol, this is Tyler. I wanted to ask you about my recent surgery. Hey, Tyler, I see that you had a total knee replacement five days ago with Dr. Beanie. I have access to your records and can help you with any questions you may have. Thank you, Sol. First, I don't remember what they found at surgery. You know, I was a little out of it. No worries. I just read your operative report and reviewed the visual records from the operating room. You had exposed bone on both sides of the joint and a torn meniscus. These are both considered excellent indications for surgery so you can expect very good resolution of your symptoms. <laughs> That's great. The live XR was kind of cool. So I'm glad it was correct. Also, the drone delivery with my medications arrived just as I got home, but I can't remember which pills to take or when. Can you tell me? Yes. Of course, the discharge summary states that you should take the pain medicine about 20 minutes before you put on your headset for your virtual reality meditation therapy. And my leg, it's uh, a little swollen as well. Should I be concerned? First, let's run a thermal scan. You have my permission. Thank you. Voice print activation enabled. According to the scan, the skin surface temperature and tensile grade is not suggestive of any complication of a clot in your leg. Okay, well, that's super helpful, Soul. I feel much better. Yes, I can see and hear that. Your anxiety measures dropped seven points. <laughs> that's so cool how you can just see that. So, I don't know if you remember Mohan yesterday, for those of you who here, said that until you see it, until you feel it, you don't get it. This is what happens when you take one technology, pair it to another technology, link it to a third technology, then a fourth and a fifth. Drones for delivery of medicine. Avatars to have a humanistic conversation with the patient. A thermal scan. That's the only thing in that whole thing that doesn't exist. And I tried with 3M to make that happen. We couldn't quite get it to work. The ability of that avatar to link to your health record and read the results back to you, explain them, seem extremely futuristic in 2019 when I wrote this text. Today, you all see that as ChatGPT 3. ChatGPT is learning at 10% per day. Its power is increasing 10% per day. It's doubling every seven days quote, unquote, Chad Altman. I mean, um, Altman because he told a friend of mine at a coffee spot. So it's, this is the future of telehealth, not Zoom, right? So when you start thinking about the technologies, when you go to see the vendors out there, think of yourself, what if they were linked? What could happen? And that's really the big, big bonus that you start to connect the dots when you get these ideas. All right, so then what happened? Huh. 
Then we had a non-human made virus show up and that changed everything. And then we went virtual, and as I mentioned earlier, we got to 4,000, 5,000 people watching. We had a great partnership with the Academy that year. Um, we did this twice, and then in January 2021, uh, it looked like, in 2022, it looked like things were going to be, um, to open up again. So we did a very quick put together conference here last year, uh, which also is very exciting, and we decided to push the, push the envelope. We we'll put everybody in 2035 was to ask all our speakers to tell us what the world would look like in 2035. All those videos are available. It was an extraordinary step into uh, the future. I think Jared was blown away that time. He, that was your first one, uh, first Doc SF. Uh, and now we're here. Now it's 2023, and we're doing the digital transformation of outpatient surgery. And how far have we come? In 2017, when we brought in companies to talk to us, they're mostly outside of orthopedics. It was potential use in orthopedics. Today, we're going to hear an entire day of companies working specifically in our space. All the major players, the strikers of the world, are doing this work to bring us the technology and embedding it into our, our workspace. So what seemed so futuristic six, seven years ago is now real. Oops, sorry, wrong button. We've gone on to world domination. We have the experience, which is where you're at today. But we've also have now two years we've been doing our own event at JPM, specifically focusing, took all the venture stuff out of DocSF because it appealed to a different audience and actually kept it at JP Morgan. Uh, we've been in Berlin. We just launched DocSF Japan last year. Um, <clears throat> we've had webinars. And for those of you who drive, I highly recommend our podcast, the Digital Orthopedics Podcast. I introduce it, I close it, but all the content is from our speakers at the various DocSF events, and a lot of that information is kind of evergreen, and I think you'd really, really enjoy it. So what next? To some extent, I feel like we've achieved our goal. In other words, we've brought the concept of digital orthopedics into the audience. It's out there. We're a pretty strong brand, and we're no longer the only ones talking about this. Pretty much every conference you go to will have some discussion on AI, or we'll talk to you about robotics, or talk about these technologies that six to seven years ago were unconscionable. So we'd like to also update our format. The economy has changed. Um, people are not traveling quite so much. Uh, so we'll get to that and we'll be seeking input from everybody about how that should look. But the thing I'm interested in doing is this. How can we solve a big problem? We've created an amazing community. We have those of you here today, those who have come before us, and also the thousands that follow us online. Now, remember I mentioned kinetic alignment way back when. There was a reason I mentioned that. When those of us who are fans of the technique we're going up against 50 years of dogma and had to prove our point, that it's actually better. And as far as we could tell, with the data available, something called patient-reported outcome measures, a sheet of paper handed to a patient before surgery, and again, perhaps at a year later, with 20 or 30 questions on it, that's the best we could do, apparently, um, we can show it's better. So I started to say, well, you know, we have these sensors. So I started strapping sensors on patients. But the data wasn't that great. And if you look at all the data that's been published now on wearables, the R-squared values, the, the correlation of the data with the outcome you're looking for is in the 70% range. That's the best studies. And that is not good enough for clinical grade. So I was a little disappointed. So I went to TED. Um, which I think an amazing place. A few conferences I go to to get inspired. One of them is TED. The other one is Next Med, which is Daniel Kraft's conference. And I heard a talk from a fellow you'll hear from tomorrow. His name is Ivan. And Ivan gave this amazing talk. He was running a division at Google at the time. And the way he thought about sensors was so different from anything I'd ever heard before. I said, you know what? I need to track this guy down. So I have a lot of friends that work at Google. And sure enough, at some point, I got a hold of him. And I said, look, this is what I'm doing. I'm putting these sensors on people. I'm having them walk in the gay lab, and I just can't seem to correlate anything. And he goes, oh, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> I say, what, what? No, hold on a second. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not doing it wrong. He said, no, you're doing it completely wrong. I'm like, okay, well, how do you do it? Well, he says, you've got to take the raw data, not the process data. 
you got to get each of the axes on that sconiometer and accelerometer, put them into a convolutional neural network, but not just any convolutional network. It has to be a sequence to sequence network. And then give me the output you're trying to find, and I'll find in that noise that pattern. Like, ah. Uh, I'm not looking for step counts, Ivan. I want to get knee angular moments, I, I, all these really crazy outputs that we can only get in a gate lab. Just let me see if we can do. This bottom graph looks like two overlaid. This, the difference is 0 0.05. The R rate, the, the error rate, the mean error rate is 0 0.05. It is nearly a perfect replica of knee angular velocity in a patient walking in our gate lab, obtained from two sensors that costs about $20. What this told us is that we can take the most complex methodology that we have for measuring gait and make it accessible in the real world. We've never had, correct me if I'm wrong, the ability to collect real world data on a continuous basis in a way that we then replicate motion. We haven't. And it's not because we didn't have the hardware. We've had the hardware for decades, right? How long have we had the sensors for? At least 30, 40 years. They're getting cheaper. What we didn't have is the ability to make sense of the raw data. That is the beauty of all this AI stuff that's coming down our pike, is we have a tremendous amount of data that we don't know what to do with. We don't know how to make sense of it. This allows us to make sense at least of this part of it. And what it allows us to start thinking about is, is there a way for us? to measure human mobility? Sounds like a stupid question, I agree. But, wrong button. What's the goal of all healthcare? I'm gonna make this crazy statement. The entire goal of the entire healthcare system, every aspect of it, psychiatry, pediatrics, trauma surgery, spine, arthroplasty for sure, is to keep us moving. So you can be independent when you're older, so you can run if you're a kid, so you can play sports, so you can go to work every day, so you can interface with other humans. It's mobility. But do we have a way to measure it? How do you measure mobility? We don't have a measure of mobility. Certainly not one that's standardized, validated, has a normative data set is useful. Let's take it from the top. Standardization means not just the software that delivers the variable, but also the hardware that delivers it. So it has to be hardware agnostic. It has to be validated, not just in the United States, not just in males, but across the entire experience of humanity because the way we move in space differs. We have to have a normative data set. When you use your iWatch, iPhone, to track your, your step count, you're tracking it against yourself. But what, for us in medicine to decide if someone's doing well or not well, we need to know how they're doing relative to someone like them. Peloton, I was in the gym this morning, that works so well because you get to choose who you compete with. You get to compete with people like you, your age, your gender. It's really, really compelling. And it has to be useful. It has to be something we can get our head around. It's a big ask, but I'm thinking that maybe we've built this community, the smartest and the brightest in, in musculoskeletal care, can we take on a grand challenge? Can we leverage DocSF to move on to, come to, to drive this idea of mobility as a vital sign? Now, I'd say that if we had our mission in 2017, 2023 was to catalyze the adoption of digital health tools in orthopedics, which I think to some extent is about providing education and creating community. Thank you for making that happen. Thank you for all of you who've come to DocSFs in the past and the future. But what does our future look like? And there's no slide here, because I'd like to have that conversation with any of you that have come to this conference. We're going to be sending this uh, talk out into the, into, the way, into, the, into the world soon. But anybody that's been participating, sponsors, attendees, uh, friends of DocSF, let's have this conversation. This is, a, this is a great, grand concept that we have the ability to potentially tackle for the first time. In, uh, in, in the history of humanity is measuring in a way that we can then collect data, measure mobility, we can collect data and optimize the work that we do on a daily basis. So with that, I want to thank everybody and leave you with a video. Now, this has nothing to do with anything.
But this is what makes it interesting. This is what I like to do, drop these little thought bombs in DocSF, get you think about differently. This is a video about a school in China. So let's just run it. Hopefully the audio sounds. This primary school in China. Know exactly when someone isn't paying attention. These headbands measure each student's level of concentration. The information is then directly sent to the teacher's computer and to parents. Classrooms have robots that analyze students' health and engagement levels. Students wear uniforms with chips that track their locations. There are even surveillance cameras that monitor how often students check their phones or yawn during classes. But schools say it wasn't hard for them getting parental consent to enroll kids into what is one of the world's largest experiments in AI education, a program that's supposed to boost students' grades while also feeding powerful algorithms. Okay. So this probably is generating a lot of emotion. What we have to get past when we look at technology is, in my opinion, emotion. Technology is. It's not good. It's not bad. It just is. Healthcare is not affordable. Healthcare as we know it is not scalable. The alternative has to be digital. It's the only way we'll move forward. It's not good. It's not bad. It's not that the old way of doing things, and me giving you a hug when you come into the office, is better than doing it virtually. It's just that if I can't see you because you live 200 miles away and there's no doctor anywhere near you, the virtual version is better than no healthcare at all. So with that, I want to turn it over and start the conference. Thank you for letting me frame it. Thank you for supporting DocSF, and uh, welcome to DocSF 2023. <laughs> All right. Well, DocSF doesn't happen on its own. I'd like for all of you to stand up for a second and turn around. And Christina, I know you hate this, but I want everybody to give you a round of applause. I cannot tell you how much work Christina's done to make this happen. She is an, an incredible uh, um, director of operations for us. And now going on to the conference. Um, Mike Ass has been also incredibly helpful to me this year. He's, he's pulled together some of his uh, closest friends <laughs> in the world of the ASC space and has pulled together what I think is one of the most interesting sessions we've ever had here at DocSF. Um, can you go on back to the slide deck, please? Uh, Mike is a orthopedic surgeon at HSS, Hospital Special Surgery in New York City. He specializes in hip and knee replacement and serves as the Chief Medical Innovation Officer and President of the HSS ASC Development Network. Mike asked to dock us that stage, please. Thank you. Good, mor good morning, everybody, and uh, thanks so much. Um, I guess I'll, I'll start. We're gonna, this doesn't have any slides or anything. I'm not fancy enough to put together videos. Actually, what we're going to do is, uh, is we're going to bring up a panel of, uh, of experts, and we're just going to talk about the world of, of orthopedic healthcare today. So as Stefano alluded to earlier, the biggest thing happening in the world of orthopedics is this transition, this shift from uh, inpatient surgery to outpatient surgery. So what does that mean? That means that uh, when I was in training 15 years ago, patients came in for their surgeries to our big uh, multi-specialty hospital, right? We had cardiology and urology and orthopedics in it. And they got a hip or a knee replacement and they stayed there for three or four or five days, and then they went to a rehab center for another two or three weeks, and this was, this was the path. This was the only way it happened, and this was true for our shoulder replacements, for our spine surgeries, for our hip and knee replacements, and even for our ACL reconstructions. Today, so I, I flew here yesterday from New York. Uh, right before I left, I did uh, three hip and knee replacements in the morning, so I had to make it to the airport on time, and by the time I got on the plane, every single one of those patients was, at home, was home. They were on their couch, they were resting, hopefully they were icing their knee like I told them to do. But that's the world. The world is what used to take a month of recovery, we do in four hours. And what used to occur in these big, giant, brick and mortar hospitals is now happening in much more affordable, much more value-driven sites of service, uh, the most common of which is the ambulatory surgery center. So to talk a little bit about what that means and how that's affected our, 
our world and not just how our patients are affected, but how our operations are affected, how our surgeries have changed, and how the way we look at uh, the places where we work have changed. I'm gonna bring up two separate panels. So the first panel, we're gonna talk about the clinical side. So how has this changed what we do from a clinical perspective? We've got some clinical experts here that are gonna join us in a second. And then the second panel is gonna focus on the operational side. And both of them are gonna try to just set the stage for what we're gonna hear for the rest of today, which are what are some of the solutions out there to the challenges we now face because of this shift from out inpatient outpatient surgery. So if my first panel wouldn't mind joining me, I'll sort of introduce them as they come on their way up. Uh, First, we're gonna have Laith Farjo. Uh, Laith is an orthopedic surgeon um, and also an owner of an ambulatory surgery center and an independent private practice. And so we'll bring us the perspective of exactly what it's like to own one of these centers and, and see how they work. Next is Debbie Gee. Debbie is the executive director of the orthopedic service line and the ambulatory surgery centers at UCSF, so home, hometown hero. And finally is uh, do, do, Dr. John J.P. Warner. So. Uh, if you don't know who Dr. Warner is, it just means maybe you don't spend a lot of time in the world of orthopedics because everyone who does what I do knows exactly who Dr. Warner is. Uh, he is a professor at Harvard Medical School, a world famous orthopedic surgeon, and also, uh, if for some might not know, a serial entrepreneur and a person who really understands what it takes to take an idea from concept to, uh, to fruition. So uh, thank you all for joining me. Uh, I, we really appreciate it. And so what we're gonna to try to cover here today with all of you is, is the idea of the world has changed a little and, and certainly since we uh, have started in our practices or in our careers, it looks very different. So Laith, we'll start with you. What are the two or three most common cases you're seeing, right? You own an ASC. What, what are you seeing come to your ASC that wasn't there five or 10 years ago? So the big thing is what you do, uh, <laughs> joint replacement. So that everything now is, is shifting from the hospital. So I trained a little before you. I trained 30 years ago. And people would be admitted for a day before to get their testing, and then they would stay for two weeks. Uh, so knee replacement, hip replacement, shoulder replacement, those are the big things. Uh, and spine surgery is also moving to our center as well. Yeah, and, and Debbie, you're watching this happen in, in the local ASCs. Are you seeing a similar shift? Are those the kind of cases coming? What's happening? to the cases that were already there. Are they moving too, or are you just getting busier? We're just getting busier, but um, <laughs> definitely those are the same uh, types of cases that we're starting to see in the outpatient arena. And JP, you work at sort of the mecca of education, healthcare, everything in the world, right? The Harvard system, whether it's Harvard Business Review that apparently Stefano reads more than he reads JBGS, which probably shouldn't say in this crowd, but you know, whatever. Um, or, 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 it's in, or it's in medicine, right? Harvard's always led the world. So how, how, are, how do, like, when you see these cases moving, how is Harvard dealing with that? What do they think? Are they seeing the same shift? Are they controlling that shift? Are they trying to pull it back? So I, I think it's fair to say that I work in one of the most complex organizations you can imagine, and there are lots of moving parts and different layers. Fortunately, our ASC started when it was a little more simple, and we created a culture that endured above all of the complexity that followed. So in reality, as most academic medical centers are, we were a late adopter for ASCs. 16 years ago, we started a small ASC that was so successful from a financial point of view that it took them about uh, that long, 16 years, to create another one. And along the way, the role of the physician has been affected greatly versus the people in the administrative office, which makes us quite different from what probably is being discussed here. So I want everybody to remember that that things happen in context of the perspective of where you happen to be and the environment in which you live. And so I'm gonna guess that the three of us here have completely different environments in which to work. And so when you ask me about the organization, um, you know, it becomes a question of push or pull. And it's problematic for many things that we know can improve our, our profitability. And in those ASCs, so now you say in those 32 years, you've got two of them. Um, are they similar? Do they run the same way clinically? Are there, are they, do, they, do they do a little bit of everything? Is there ENT being done in the same center? Is it all orthopedics? So um, they're actually of different cultures. The first ASC that we created, we specifically created, orthopedics did, because four physicians who are founders, I'm one of those, the last one remaining, um, believed there was a better way to do things than what we had in the hospital. We said, we're going to leave. And they said, don't do that. We'll build it for you. That is the, you know, on honey for the fly, and unfortunately that led to all sorts of issues. But our performance was tremendous. And I, I, when I went to HBS, I analyzed the financial performance for, with KPIs relative to the hospital. Even with that kind of ROI, 
they were very late to scale this. And by the time they did, the regulatory environment changed and their strategy changed. So not only were the facility fees lowered because of what's happening in Massachusetts, but rather than building a specialty center, which we had already, which was an orthopedic specialty center, they created a multi-specialty center. And I'm sure you can figure out how that works from the standpoint of winners and losers in terms of the, the uh, services being provided there. So it's not just orthopedics that's happening in the new center, which is twice the size of the old one, but it's other things, you name it, like uh, invasive radiology or, or straightforward general surgery, things of that nature. So Debbie, is it similar at, at the UCSF centers? Are they all orthopedics? They do a little bit of everything? So at UCSF, we now have two ambulatory surgery centers. The original one um, opened 13 years ago at the Orthopedic Institute, which was the vision of Dr. Vales. Um, so that has been operating very well for many years. Um, a year ago, we opened up a second surgery center, which is everything but orthopedics. Um, and it's very interesting, though, because you know the two um, they're separate in terms of what they do, but their outcomes are very similar. So turnover time is very similar. Patient satisfaction is very similar because every month when I look at the um, metrics, it's like, oh my gosh, they're like mirrored. So um, it's interesting to see that you can segregate into a very highly specialized orthopedics and then have this other bucket, but yet run them very similar. Now, Leith, you, uh, you, you told us a few seconds ago that people like me are ruining your centers, right? We're coming in, we're taking over, the joint replacements are ruining everything. Uh, what, what's changed at the center? How does the dynamic of a center, both from a sort of clinical perspective and just sort of the general way you run it, when you bring in these new cases, these shoulder replacements, these hip and knee replacements, these spine surgeries, what changes for you? Uh, basically, the level of complexity for a patient that's coming in. So, you know, we've been in operation for about 15 years. We're uh, orthopedic specific. Uh, you know, being specialty specific, I think, drives efficiency. Uh, but we do a lot of um, very traditionally outpatient surgeries. So a carpal tunnel release, uh, which is a five-minute surgery. Uh, a shoulder arthroscopy, which is a 30-minute surgery. Um, these are all generally healthy people. There's very little blood loss. As we start to morph and bring in these other more complex cases, we're, we're taking patients who are normally in the hospital. First of all, you have to get surgeons to convince themselves that it's safe to do this. Uh, but then you have to select the appropriate patients who can come, and, and now you're doing a much bigger procedure. So when we do a shoulder replacement, you're dismantling somebody's shoulder, taking it apart through a big incision. There's bleeding, there's a lot more risk, and there's a lot more medical risk afterwards. So what's changing now in the ASC realm in orthopedics is we're learning how to deal with these more complex patients and more complex cases while still doing it very safely. So that's the goal of safety. Now, Debbie, you, you run the whole center, right? You don't just deal with the surgeons. There's also other staff there. There's nurses, there's anesthesiologists, there's lots of other people involved in the clinical care of these more complicated ca cases and patients. How are they handling it? Or how do you uh, help guide some of the clinical, uh, clinical world of the day-to-day -day workflow with these more complicated cases? So first of all, you know, we do a really, I think we do a really good job of screening these patients and making sure that they're in the right environment. Um, we have a patient selection criteria. Um, it's based upon BMI, co comorbidities, et cetera. So we have a PREPARE program, which is the pre-op program, um, which screens these patients um, to make sure that they are done where they have the support that they need, the clinical support. Um, and we've been pretty successful in the um, generic outpatient surgery center, we tend to transfer one to two patients per month. At the Orthopedic Institute, we've gone two years without transferring um, an individual. So I think that pre-screening is really important um, because you know you really, there will be times where you have to transfer a patient, but you really don't want to tell a patient, you know, we were doing outpatient surgery and then wind up having to transfer them by ambulance to another facility. And JP, you've been doing kind of surgeon-led care. You said the, your, your first surgery center was started by four surgeons that said, we need a center or we're leaving. But that's really changed to now almost all of us are in some way working within these facilities that are starting to do these more complicated cases. However, I imagine the culture of that center is built on surgeon leadership and on we're going to do the right thing because it's the right thing. How do you handle the, the safety or how do you look at the sort of clinical safety profile that changes in the profile of these patients you're now bringing to your centers? So, of course, it's collaborative and the culture that we established included individuals in leadership roles 
from outside the Mass General. Consequently, we were able to create a new culture that was directly um, juxtaposed to the, to the main hospital. And the key performance indicators were tremendous because everything begins and ends with culture. So we didn't want people bringing baggage with them. We defined what we had. And so those folks are still here working together. And I'm chair for quality and safety, so I also have oversight on what we do there. The one thing I would say is that you, if you do a large enough volume, there'll be cases that have medical issues, be they arrhythmias or something else. Um, and so you'll always have the need to transfer somebody. It's never going to be zero for long. It's just anticipating these kinds of problems and what's your threshold for allowing these cases to be done. 95% uh, of all the arthroplasties that I do are done in an ASC setting, and that comes in large measure from what anesthesia has done to improve their postoperative pain management. And I do <clears throat> what, um, what most of us should do, which is measure everything. And when we look at patient satisfaction, we look at pain patterns, et cetera, um, we've succeeded in having actually arthroplasty patients have a lot less pain than the rotator cuff repair patients, who we were sending home anyway for a long time. So the, the wind in our sails came with the pandemic, of course, and everything shifted. And while we were a late adopter for these guys probably been doing this a lot longer for doing those kinds of cases, it moved pretty quickly because every single day I get an announcement that the hospital's on emergency divert. And I work in a general hospital, not like you in a specialty hospital. And so we compete for resources in that organization. And now we're creating value by allowing more capacity by bringing patients to the ASC. And the administrators understand that, and that's why they support what we do. And I think it's great. You know, it's amazing that we're sitting here having a clinical conversation about shifts in the world, but what it really all comes back to is culture, right? You know, we say at our institution, culture is strategy, right? They're not separate. They're not, they're not different. They, they drive each other. So it's just fascinating that you bring that up, too, because I think it's, it's just critically important in any large organization. Now, you do have the large organization, but you have your sort of small place that you're running within that sort of very complicated ecosystem. What's, what's the biggest clinical challenge you've seen when you went from knee scopes and carpal tunnels to shoulder replacements and spine surgery? What's, what's, what's been your biggest clinical challenge? I think the logical thing, there are lots of issues, but the logical thing is inventory management. And um, I think we'll talk about, you know, robotics and all that stuff, but with, um, with uh, preoperative planning, which is what I do, I know pretty accurately what implants, what that I'm going to need there. And so the opportunity to reduce your SKUs and the number of trays and such increase your efficiency and reduce cost and complexity. So, so that's been something we've been working on that I know others are working on as well because you really don't want the same footprint in the ASC that you have in the main hospital. Debbie, how about you as you've seen these, these different kind of what, what we sort of term as higher acuity cases, these spines, hip and knees, shoulder arthroplasties, what, are the cl what clinical challenges have you seen, and not just from what the surgeons kind of talk about, but what you hear from your nursing teams, what you hear from the rest of the care providers, um, what, what do you see as the kind of the biggest challenge as that shift occurs? Um, I think one of the things kind of tangential is, you know, I think it's really important to schedule your inpatient cases in the inpatient arena and the outpatient in the outpatient arena. Because I think sometimes people are tempted to do, you know, two inpatient cases and we'll add a um, outpatient case at the end of the day or something like that. Um, and I think a lot of this goes back to your surgery schedulers. I think it's important for them to understand that there is a lot of efficiency and a lot of value to segregating those inpatient and outpatient days. Um, and even, you know, if you have a really sharp um, surgery scheduler and you have two rooms, it's even better if, you know, one room is the left side and one is the right side. I mean, there's a lot of efficiencies to be gained with that. Um, so, you know, because you're not moving equipment, et cetera. But to me, what we have found the challenge is just having that mix of um, inpatient, outpatient, um, and having to pull the outpatient cases from the inpatient arena. Finally, finally, somebody who is uh, agreeing with me, I say it all the time, like I only like to do a day of left knees or a day of right knees or a day of left hips or a day of right hips. It's not that I have anything about left or right. It's you don't have to change where things are in the room. You don't have to move the suction from one side to the other. It makes him go much faster. So I do left knees and left hips or right knees and right hips in my two rooms. And I just, my schedulers go crazy about it. But uh, It makes a difference. It makes such a huge difference and it seems so silly. So Leith, you've been, you've got a, a, an orthopedic, but everything orthopedic, like you said, you do carpal tunnels, you do, how do you handle the carpal tunnel surgeries 
when you're trying to do shoulder replacements? And how do you sort of start to balance the higher acuity cases that are now coming in that you're trying to absorb without losing the bread and butter of what runs your center? Like, what, what's the consideration look like for you? So we've been fortunate. We've been doing this for a long time, and we have staff that's used to doing this. So we don't um, rely on the surgical schedulers to make these decisions. We make the decisions. And so, for example, um, I'll start my day. I, I might have 15 surgeries in a day. Uh, but I'll start off with a little kickoff case like a carpal tunnel while they're getting my shoulder replacement ready for me in the second room. So we have two, I usually have two rooms. Um, so there's efficiencies to be gained by knowing what the procedure is, what the equipment um, needs are for that procedure, what the time constraints for, are for that procedure, and then having a complementary thing on the other side. And, and similarly to you, the right shoulders work better in room two than you know, left shoulders work better in room five. Um, so we've learned over time, um, you know, how to bounce things back and forth, um, compress our schedule because uh, one of the big issues in um, ASCs is labor. Uh, and so we don't want to have a room sitting empty without uh, being utilized. We don't want to have staff sitting around for a long time without being utilized. Uh, so there's this balancing act between um, getting everything done safely but also efficiently. And I think it does uh, go to the idea of why you can drive so much more value in these small facilities in that you can really minimize downtime. Hospitals, big hospitals, sort of have to have downtime. You have to have emergency staff available if something comes in. You have to have the room available for trauma cases. There's a lot you need to do to be prepared for what might happen. Versus an ambulatory surgery center, the schedule came out yesterday. You know exactly what's going to happen. And minimizing downtime really allows you to drive significant value in these centers, which was a Perfect segue, so thank you for that. To talk about the business side of it a little bit, so JP, I don't think anybody's done more work in this than, than you have, at least from really taking a high level perspective look at how do these centers really work, where are you shifting costs and able to work within an organization, but also at the level of the center, what does that look like? So how do you think this shift, this, your shoulder replacements that used to be in, done in the main hospital, now being done in the ambulatory surgery center, the, the same thing for spine and joint replacements. How do you think this is affecting the business models and profitability of these ambulatory surgery centers? Well, um, one of the things that should be mentioned, in addition to culture and the, and the incentives that you put in place, are the economics of how you measure. And so in our ambulatory center, we have the ability, potentially, to look at margin per surgeon, margin per case, et cetera. We just finished an analysis of 700 rotator cuff repairs by 24 surgeons and identified that the, from the lowest cost to the highest cost with the codes applied was a factor of 8x. Now, then it becomes a question of what do you use that information for and to what degree you have alignment and partnership with your organization, whether you have a LLC or an employment model or whatever, but gain sharing is the only way that you can improve on the bottom line with that kind of data. We can get that data at our ASC. We also, I also know which specialties are more um, margin, margin favorable than others based on just RVUs and what they tend to get. And so how you apportion your cases and what you do there affects your overall profitability. Um, in addition to that, the staff are incentivized in, with a different model than the main hospital. I should also add the main hospital uses more cost averaging than specifics. So I can't really compare apples and oranges because that's what we have. But the motivation of our staff is based on not just patient satisfaction and metrics such as turnover time, but surgeon satisfaction, which I've never heard applied before. I mean, I don't know if you guys do that, but that's very important for them. And consequently, that has actually filtered into the system. And when that was applied to one of our facilities at North, the graph for productivity went like, like that. So behavioral economics is critically important to the success of these ventures, and most of our major um, academic medical centers that have multiple specialties don't understand that, in my opinion. That's how we created a different culture that is margin-driven and more financially successful than the main hospital. And I wish, you know, from that, that video of that school in China, I wish we had one of those facial recognition attention things a second ago, because you said the word data, and I saw Dr. Beanie light up. He was so excited. So, uh, so we have to get a scanner for him next year. Debbie, what a, what data do you use? What data do you make available? What data do you use? Maybe it's on the surgeon satisfaction or on the profitability of the center. And how, how do you use that data? Again, sort of in, to JP's point, you can use the data in a lot of different ways and a lot of especially large uh, mega health systems use it differently. So what data do you have access to and how do you use it? 
Yeah, we have um, access to a lot of data, and we actually share it with the staff because we really want the staff to have ownership. They want to know what is happening, how they're performing as a whole in the surgery center. So we look at patient satisfaction, surgeon satisfaction, volume, turnover time, first case on time starts. We share all of that information with them. We celebrate it when we're doing really well because we want them to have the credit and when we've taken a dip in something and we all huddle and we say, hey, what happened this month, et cetera. So I think data is very powerful and very important and like I said, um, we're very transparent with it to the staff. They look at it and really they take ownership and that's the whole part of the culture. You want them to have the ownership of the surgery center um, to make sure that it's efficient and running well. Now, now, Leif, your center is privately owned. You're, you're the boss, the CFO, the banker, the everybody. What, what's your, what are your thoughts on sort of that data and financial transparency? And then sort of a second question to layer on there. How has that sh this shift of higher acuity cases changed the profitability and the business side of your center? So, you know, as a for-profit center, we've had the data that JP was talking about for 15 years. We know exactly how long everybody takes to do a surgery, and, and surgeons don't like being uh, told that they're a little too slow. Um, you know, as a CEO, one of my jobs is to encourage our um, surgeons to be more efficient, and a lot of that is implant choice. So you can't really make a surgeon faster. You don't want to push somebody outside of their comfort zone, uh, but you can ask them to use implant B as opposed to implant A. And the way we do that is competition. I don't think there's a single orthopedic surgeon I know that's not type A, and it's not highly competitive. So I'll have our, our annual uh, meeting, I'll throw up a chart. Um, it's not anonymized, everybody can see everybody else's names, and you can see where you sit as far as cost of care. Um, cost of care, when we can break it down, we can break it down to implants, we can break it down to time-based cost of care, because every minute uh, in a, a surgical facility is worth a dollar amount, and it's a lot of money. You know, a lot of our facility, it's about $20 a minute is how much that time is worth when you look at all the labor, everything involved in it. And so uh, competing, uh, having surgeons compete against each other for that has been very helpful. And then finally, um, having staff know how much implants cost is important as well, as Debbie alluded to here, they can help the surgeons out. That's great. Well, uh, I wanna thank you very much for helping us set the stage for today. Thank you for your insights, and we really appreciate your time. Thank you, everybody. So uh, up next, I'm going to call up our, uh, our second uh, panel of speakers. Again, I'll kind of do a quick intro as they come on up. This way we can get started so I don't get that big hook thing that I just got from Stefano 10 seconds ago because I, I hate that feeling. I don't like going over time because Kevin's next to him. And when you go over time at Kevin's meeting, he shuts off all the lights and sends everyone home. Um, so first, we're going to have uh, Neil Badlani come up. When, when uh, Stefano made the joke of I just brought my friends here with me, this is, this is actually where that joke comes from. Neil and I probably spend a little too much time together and probably should see our families a little more than we see each other. Uh, Neil's a spine surgeon in Texas. He's an owner of both an ASC and a hospital, so kind of really brings a unique perspective to it. Uh, after him, we got Tommy Wildbacker. Tommy is the VP of Sales and Corporate Strategy for a digital health-enabled company called Ospitec that we'll probably hear a little bit more about. Um, also has some experience throughout the logistics chain, having had multiple roles over his career within orthopedics. And finally, we have Oren Schill, uh, Oren is the group president of operations for SCA. SCA Health is actually what it's called now, right? Oren, I don't want to mess it up. SCA Health was rebranded. For those who don't know what that is, SCA Health is a surgery center branch of Optum Health, which is one of the largest pieces of United Health Group. So uh, uh, there's no question that the three people up here probably know more about operations and logistics of ambulatory surgery centers uh, than anyone we could ask for. So thank you all so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Um, we'll kind of get, we'll get moving quickly. So we just heard that all of these shifts are happening. We've heard that we're now doing shoulder replacements and hip replacements and spine surgery, spine, is that a thing? They still yeah, do absolutely. spine surgery? Um, we, spine uh, surgery in, uh, in ASCs. So how, Neil, how has that changed your center? How has, uh, how has this shift of high acuity cases, does that one work? Yeah. All right. How has this changed the operations of your centers? What, what's, what's different now that you have to consider? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, I, I think it's a very team uh, approach and everyone kind of has to buy in. I think there's a, a notion when a patient comes in for spine surgery that it's gonna be a big procedure with blood loss and a long time in the hospital, right? 
So we have to, you know, the surgeons have to buy in and, and they have to have the whole staff buy in, everyone from my front desk to uh, my assistant, everyone sort of has the attitude and the approach that we're going to do this case and it's going to be a minimally invasive case and it's going to be done in a surgery center and um, the patient's going to go home and it's going to be fine. So everyone buying into that and educating the patient that way from the start. Um, our anesthesia partners are critical, as it, as it was said before, so um, we have to be very um, careful with patient selection. So we know that when patients um, stay, uh, it's usually a medical issue, a cardiac issue, diabetes, sleep apnea. So our anesthesia providers um, have to really um, help us understand which patients are safe to do in that space, and sometimes we have to say no. You know, if uh, the BMI is too high or uh, we're concerned about a cardiac issue, then we don't do it. Um, and then um, postoperatively, most of the reason that patients need to stay in the hospital is for pain. So we have to be uh, more understanding of pain control. And again, that's where anesthesia can help us with multimodal pain management. Like for spine cases, we may use Lyrica pre-op, we may use Tylenol intra-op, we may use uh, muscle relaxants post-op, steroids post-op. So really having that protocol in place to minimize narcotics, because a lot of the uh, reasons that patients can't go home are side effects of narcotics, right? Um, and then we can have all those great protocols in place, but something still may happen that a patient needs to stay or a patient needs to be transferred. So, you know, we learned we want to have all those contingency plans in place from the beginning. Um, it's happened very rarely, but if we need to transfer a patient to the hospital, we need to know how we do that, what is the protocol. You don't want to be just sort of calling 911 at the last minute, right? Um, and then another thing that, that you don't realize, in, in the hospital you have a lot of resources of other physicians. If, if we have an issue with bleeding, you know, we, we don't necessarily have somebody on call, but we have had to call a vascular surgeon to help us out. So we just need to know that we have those, um, those plans in place. If we get a, a CSF leak and we have to fix it and we need a patient to stay for 23-hour OBS, we want to make our 23-hour observation experience for the patient great as well. So we just need to have all those uh, safeguards in place. Anything that could happen in the hospital could also happen in the surgery center. So we want to prepare uh, logistically to take care of all those things. That's great. Now, Oren, literally the word operations is in the title of your, of your job description. So, so what, are, what are some of the operational challenges you're seeing in some of the surgery centers that you help to partner and run? Well, first and foremost, it's, it's making sure that the center that we're going to introduce these service lines into can perform the, the surgery safely, right? So is, are the ORs big enough? Is the SPD big enough for the throughput? Is the PACU big enough for the flows of the patients? To Because with these surgeries, they're staying longer um, than a typical surgery. And so we got to make sure that the flows are there. And then there's also, uh, as you mentioned, the anesthesia. It's a huge issue for us now, especially here and I'm sure across the nation, but ensuring that we've got that coverage and, and then the staff training to ensure that our staff are trained because these uh, these higher acuity cases take more interactions with the patients preoperatively, operatively, and then postoperatively. So we want to make sure that we have all those um, pathways lined out. And Tommy, you've sort of seen this from all three sides. You've seen it when you were helping physicians make the transition and help plan for their cases in these surgery centers. You've now seen it from the operations of actual surgery centers and also from digital solutions to some of these problems. So what are the logistical, give me two big logistical changes, big logistical challenges that surgeons have as they're starting to take these in traditionally inpatient cases and bring them to surgery centers? Well, I think, um, you know, when we, when we start looking at, uh, you, you know, the shift from the hospital into the inpatient or in, into the ASC setting, we're seeing a lot of problems with the, you know, the equipment, right? That's been brought up. We talked about it a little bit yesterday. How do we prepare for that? And then the sterile processing is, is you know, it's been brought up several times during this meeting. But when you start looking at and, and seeing that view coming in from, uh, from the outside and looking at from a surgeon perspective and the administrative perspective and, and also looking from the vendor perspective, there's a lot of trays that are coming in there. And how do we optimize that? And so that's the biggest probably challenge that uh, we heard a couple talks yesterday. How do we bridge that gap from clinical all the way back onto the other side of the football field that was mentioned yesterday? And if anybody gets a, a time to pull JP, JP aside, he does a lot of work in sort of the pre-planning for surgery. And I think that has a lot to do with those logistical challenges of storage, of uh, sterilization, of infrastructure management, because a lot of these centers are little and hospitals are big. And that's, that, that really actually makes a big difference. So. 
So if you were thinking about it, Tommy, and, and you're looking at it from all three of the lenses that, that you like to use, wh what's the, what is the logistical challenge that keeps you up at night? Well, I mean, uh, the logistical challenge that probably keeps me up n at night thinking about it, the solution that's, that's out there is, is, you know, well, uh, it probably resonates with me as we talk about a lot of it is patient satisfaction. Trying to make, uh, you know, the, the, that patient feeling great. I, I personally have had some family members going into that space or, you know, having surgery this year and being, um, you know, not getting into specifics of OSPI tech, but knowing that being aware of what your loved ones are doing and right now keeping me up at light night, that's probably the biggest thing, but also providing the real-time uh, KPIs to allow for uh, your customers to, to, to be the most efficient they can be. Orrin, what do you think? What keeps, what, what keeps you up at night? What keeps your team up at night saying, boy, we've got 250 surgery centers around the country. They're all, do, they're all feeling this shift. They're seeing this shift. What's keeping you up at night to try to make sure it all goes smoothly? I think one of the biggest things is, again, the physical plant to ensure that we have, um, when there's a need in the community, that we've got a physical plant that can handle it. I've got one in LA right now where the, uh, we have physicians that, that want to come and we don't have the SPD space. We can't do anything with the center, so we're not gonna be able to do it. So how can we ensure that we find a solution that may be outside the center to be able to do these? And I would say the second one uh, is anesthesia. Uh, again, just because we need to not only find the coverage, but the right coverage, as was mentioned in the clinical portion, you know, it's, it's very different type of care that they do on these, on these um, high acuity cases than they do normally. And Neil, as our surgeon representative of, of this panel, what, what keeps you up at night from an operations or logistics perspective as you're you know, running these big centers doing lots, of, doing lots of high acuity cases? Yeah, as we've been saying, I mean, there's space issues, right? In, in the spine, we need a big table, we need a microscope, we need um, a C-arm, uh, we need a lot of trays. And we're, we're moving to an ASC, which is usually a smaller space. We're trying to do something that's sort of disruptive to the hospital. And in spine surgery, we continue to sort of invent bigger, fancier, more expensive things, right? It almost goes against what, what we're doing. So we need to, you know, kind of think about um, doing robotics or doing navigation uh, with a, something that's more efficient and smaller and cost effective. Um, we need to think about, um, you know, not having 57 trays for our spine case, right? So it's the space, the logistics of that. And then cost. All, all of these things that we invent are, are, are costly and they don't necessarily increase your reimbursement. And when we move to the ASC space, one of the reasons we're moving there is to contain healthcare costs. But that also means the reimbursement for, um, you know, a spinal fusion in the ASC is 60% of what it is in the hospital. But if the implant cost is the same, then the margin becomes, um, you know, not, not doable anymore. So um, it's thinking about reimbursement systems, thinking about the cost, really maybe working with our industry partners and, and you know, figuring out ways to, to decrease cost um, so that we can be in the ASC space and still have it make sense for the bigger cases. So I think uh, all of those bring up the point that we're trying to do more with less more in a more constrained environment. And in almost every other field we've ever heard of, the answer to that is technology, right? Some new technology, one way or the other, that's gonna allow us to do more with less. So Orrin, what are two points of pain for you at the moment that you think technology has an opportunity? And you don't have to, there doesn't have to be a solution yet, but sort of what are two pain points you think technology could help you with? I think one of the biggest is the interface with the patient themselves and, and with the surgeon. And there's some platforms out there, whether it's One Medical or Ospitec, um, that help us interface with the patient preoperatively to ensure that they're doing what they need to do with their family operatively so that they know where they are and then tracking outcomes um, and more so satisfaction post-operatively. Uh, and then one of them, uh, Dr. Weir talked about yesterday, was tracking the actual outcomes live would be uh, very helpful. Tommy, I don't want to turn this into a, 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 a sales pitch of any kind, so not including what you do for a living, <laughs> what are two other parts of the logistics chain, operational chain, that you think technology could help in? 
Well, I, I, I do think, uh, you know, Dr. Benny mentioned uh, connecting those dots, right? And there's a lot of solutions out there that we can connect those dots. And, and I think when we start w looking into even some of the most complex and we take the most complex orthopedic cases, let's say trauma, where you don't know you're coming in, how do we, how do we again, get back to the sterile processing? I think there's a lot of technology help that can help out in the sterile processing and even on the back table. And, and we see some of those solutions today, but uh, a lot of them out there, and what's the best one, and, and what's the best one for your facility? And Neil, I'm gonna sort of, I'm gonna give you the same question, but it's gonna have a little bit of a different focus, because you brought up something that I wanna sort of conclude with as we start to wind down here, is cost, right, ROI. And, R, and ROI looks very different in different situations. ROI looks different from different lenses. So first part of the question, and I'll repeat it later in case you forget which is which. First part of the question, where do you think technology really can help us? Sort of same question, give us two. But then second question, when you look at technologies like this, when you're evaluating a new technology for your ASC, how do you look at cost? What does ROI mean to you there? And how is that different than what it used to mean to you when you were an orthopedic surgeon that went to the hospital on Tuesdays and did their two spine surgeries or three spine surgeries and went home? Yeah, this is a lot. So, um, you know, in terms of technology, there's just so many opportunities to make things um, more efficient and, and, and better in the outpatient space for a spine surgeon. So um, we have a lot of equipment, microscopes, uh, navigation, you know, robotics. So something that allows us to do image guidance uh, efficiently with a smaller footprint you know, something like augmetics, augmented reality may be better than robotics. Um, another clinical concern for a spine surgeon is blood. So if I do an anterior spine, like a lumbar disc replacement, that, that really is a case that we should be able to do in the ASC, but there's a, a chance of bleeding in that case. So bringing in the cell saver to the ASC, having blood on hand to store in the ASC, I mean, those are, those are logistical and clinical challenges we really haven't figured out well enough. So I think there's a role of technology there. Um, and then, when a spine surgeon, when a spine patient leaves the hospital, or you know, usually they stay in the hospital for several days, so I can make sure they're doing okay. But when they go home, I don't know. So you know, remote patient monitoring, remote patient therapeutics, as you alluded to, and as some of the people here are doing, I think is really helpful and, and come a long way to helping us, um, you know, have the patient go home and still feel like we're, you know, we're able to oversee their their um, improvement. Um, you know, the second question about value and, and return is is very very interesting. Um, I've been on both sides of sort of the equation for that. So I've been part of a surgery center for 12 years. It's, there's about 12, 13 of us in the surgery center. We're from different orthopedic groups. We've got a couple ENTs in there. And the good thing about the center is it is still existing 12 or 13 years down, right? It, it's been profitable enough. There's times when it's very profitable and times when it's barely profitable, but it's survived. And part of it is because all of the surgeons are dedicated to that one center and everyone is sort of cheap with their own money. So we don't, we don't really make a lot of big capital purchases. And so I think that's been good in the sense of like not uh, extending and not spending too much and staying uh, profitable. But at the same time, I think it holds us back a little bit. Uh, on the other side, I've been part of um, a surgery center company that didn't do too so well. And one of the things we didn't do a good great job of was making sure our surgeons were dedicated to the money we were spending technology on. So buying a big robot, you know, attracting surgeons initially, but you know, the enthusiasm kind of wore out and then you've got the cost of the robot, right? So I, I think what I learned is like just buying something because you think it's going to be great for marketing, um, you know, interesting, new, is, isn't isn't great. It has to be something that clinically um, improves what you're doing for the patients and you need surgeons to really buy into it. So if you have that, the clinical benefits, surgeons buy into it, ded dedicated surgeons, and the return is at least reasonable, then, then it, it tends to be better in the long run. Now, Oren, uh, Neil just blew my mind because he implied that at times surgeons are not reasonable and not great at business. And that's the first time I've ever heard that. I, that seems crazy to me, but how, how, do you, how do you deal with that, right? Does, does the ROI in some of your investments in technology, is it pure ROI? Is it here's, here's in and out of money and how it works? Does it ever take into account surgeon satisfaction, surgeon desire? Does it ever take into account competitive dynamics? The ASC down the road has this, does this. How, how do, how do you view sort of the investment in technology from sort of that, that bigger picture lens? Yeah, for us, it's ROI always has a tangible and an intangible component to it. There's always a financial component. It's very easy to run that ROI because you're right, we'll buy them and they don't come. 
Um, so we got to make sure that there's the buy-in that there, that's there. But more importantly, it's the intangible pieces of increasing physician satisfaction, efficiency, patient satisfaction, um, and then is it going to give us a competitive advantage in a market? And not because the surgery centers down the, the road is doing it, but more so because they're not. So we want to be the first mover and get the technology um, if we have the, the patients to support it and the surgeons to support it. But it's very important right, to make sure that they're going to come if you're going to buy it because we don't get reimbursed for it in the surgery center. We don't get reimbursed for the technology. And now just a, a quick follow-on question to that. When you, where do you find these technologies? Like, where do they come from? Is it cold calls? Is it the surgeons bring you ideas? Is it your company from a top-down perspective says, hey, here's a best practice from another center that we run? What's the, what's the, what, what's the, mech, the mechanism by which you identify these technologies? Most commonly, it's from, the sur from our surgeon partners that bring it and say, this is um, a cool technology and it'll help us here. Uh, but at SCA Health, we also have a strategic service line team uh, nationwide that works with our centers and with us on the operations side that tries to look around corners and identify these things that can make us more competitive, more efficient. Um, and then they'll bring it to the surgery centers when we're introducing a spine service line or a total joint ser service line, things like that. Now, Tommy, not to go into like trade secrets or to make you violate any NDAs on conversations you've had, but when you are bringing a new technology to a surgery center, how are you describing your ROI? Are you describing it in dollars and cents? Are you describing it, no, you have to understand this is what's gonna drive patient satisfaction. So like how do you, when you're making that, when that conversation is happening, and how's it different when it's happening with Neil or Oren? When it's happening with the surgeon or when it's happening with the uh, administrative side? Well, working with the AACs, it, there's so many stakeholders, right? I mean, you have the staff that's been doing the same. We talked about this this week. It's been doing the same process every single day. They don't want to go to new technology. Or if they were haunted by the EMR in the early 2000s, and they just don't want to go to it. But I think the biggest ROI is still decisions have to be made, right? So that's probably the biggest take. If I'm talking to an, a surgeon or if I'm talking to... Uh, and SEA uh, operations, it's, it's, they still have to make a decision. Um, and Dr. Warner just mentioned that he puts all his surgeons up in a, a list, and, and it's peer pressure, right? So how do we, um, you know, how do we, th that's the ROI, right? And so technologies can enable that, but making, taking action is really where it's at. So when we're going to the ROI is do they want to do more cases? Do they want to send their staff home? We talked about uh, the cost per minute. How do we start to optimize that? And that's finding uh, the right stakeholders and who's going to adopt the new technology is probably the, and, and try to realize real uh, ROI is, is, is what we try to capture when we're talking to them about it. And Neil, real quick before we finish, how has the role of the surgeon changed as we went from widget makers to business owners, right? We went from doing discectomies and sending them, well, who cares where, to thinking about the ROI on the technology we're using. How, how has that changed the way we practice? Yeah, I mean, yeah, you're good. How to use this thing. Yeah, I mean, it, uh, it's put more responsibility on us, and I think that's good, right? I mean, I, I think that most surgeons went into practice because they wanted to, um, you know, have as much um, independence and, and and sort of be their own boss, and and so you you have to understand the financial implications of what you're doing, as well. Uh, I think we have to realize that like healthcare costs are skyrocketing, and the shift of of surgery to the outpatient setting is probably the way that we can most significantly um, decrease cost of care, and that's our responsibility more than anyone else. On a individual day-to-day -day basis, when I'm in my surgery center and I know I'm an owner in the surgery center, I think about cost, right? Like if I know I can get through this one level ACDF with just like one gel foam patty and no other fancy things for blood loss, then that's what I'm going to do. I'll have the flow seal in the room, but I won't open the flow seal because it costs $500, right? And then on a more um, broad-based perspective, um, you know, if, if we're going to be serious about this, and as Dr. Warner um, alluded to before, I mean, we're going to try to manage um, the cost of musculoskeletal care. We're going to try to take on a leadership role and, and, and go with gain sharing. So, 
orthopedic surgeons should be the ones that are managing, um, you know, knee pain and shoulder pain and back pain and taking that population and, and figuring out the best way to spend money on it. Um, and right now, you know, other, other doctors are doing that. But we're the ones that understand who really benefits from surgery, who, who really, um, you know, it's efficient to do surgery on this patient rather than have them do six years of physical therapy and back injections and things like that, right? So um, it's good that, that, uh, that we should be in that role and, and more of us should sort of uh, should relish that opportunity. Great. Well, thank you all so much for your, for your time, for your input. We really appreciate it. And thank you to everybody for your attention for the panel. So uh, as, as Stefano alluded to earlier, if you ever invite me to anything, be very careful. I only know about 11 people, but I'll call every single one of them and make them show up. So when we were talking about the concept of the transition and translation of technology from one field to the other, immediately I thought of a, res of a restaurant on 2nd Avenue between 6th and 9th and 70th, an Italian place uh, on the Upper East Side of Manhattan. Why do I think that? Because I live on the Upper East Side of Manhattan and I really like food. Um, but what it made me think of was a great story I heard. So the story you're about to hear is a story I first heard at dinner. Um, and I'm gonna do very little introduction of the speaker because he's gonna tell the story himself. But the story is not about, hey, I'm great, and I came into healthcare because I studied healthcare my whole life and healthcare's been what I want to do and I've decided forever that I can fix healthcare. It's more of, what's this healthcare business and why are you all so bad at it? Because when I looked at what I did in the auto industry, in used cars, I can do a better job taking care of used cars than you can do of taking care of patients. And when he said that to me, I like really wanted to be insulted. I'm from Brooklyn, like that's like, you're not, you're not supposed to say stuff like that. But at the same time, I was like, well, actually halfway through the story, I'm like, he's totally right. He is totally right. Other industries have figured out much better ways to deal with logistic and operational challenges than we have. And when really start, smart people like our next speaker come into our field, they bring with them lessons from other places that might not have been about patients originally, but when they apply it to patients, they can change the paradigm. So our next speaker is Sleem Sweezy. Sleem is the CEO of uh, Ospitec, um, but much more importantly, is one of the brightest human beings I've ever met. Uh, and he's gonna talk to us a little bit about how taking a look from the outside can change the way that technology transforms an industry. So Sleem, please. <laughs> Oh, sorry. Hello? Yeah, hey, there's a clicker for your, it's a, uh, sorry. Yes. Green, green one's moved. That's your microphone, that's to move your slides. Hello? 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 Okay. Thank you, Dr. Ast, for the kind introduction, and thank you, Dr. Bini, for inviting me uh, to this conference. Uh, I'm honored to be talking to uh, such a distinguished group of medical professionals. Um, today, I'm going to be talking about my experience coming from multiple other industries before uh, healthcare and how we were able to uh, accomplish some of these uh, innovations, some of the work that we've done at the intersection of multiple industries and bring it to healthcare. I'd like to start with this quote from a, a Harvard professor. Uh, Dr. Clayton, so the most destructive ideas often come at the intersection of two different industries where concepts that are commonplace in one are applied in a new context. So we really lived through this uh, from uh, my career. I started my career as a chief scientist at Motorola uh, very early in the development of the uh, cell phone industry. Uh, from analog to digital. So I've seen all these transitions all the way to the iPhone, to the uh, mobile, mobile hotspots, to the internet of things, to the connected car, in different roles, either as a, a scientist or as a business uh, man uh, in different companies. So I would like to share this experience and how when I was exposed to the healthcare industry, how I felt there's a lot of opportunities for us to, to innovate and make changes there. So, 
Uh, I switched from wireless industry to automotive back in 2016. We happened to have an amazing product that's called MiFi. It's a mobile hotspot we created in 20, 2008. It was basically Wi-Fi in your pocket. And we sold millions of this device. And I had a customer in Jeddah in the Middle East who put 100,000 of our MiFi's in every single car. And they put these MiFi's in the car for a very nice user experience over there where you can drive your car to the desert and still be connected back in 2008, 2009. So it was very popular. When I left my previous uh, company, uh, this customer called me and they wanted to see how we can take their operation to the next level through the connected car, through the concepts of wireless. So my first trip to Jeddah, I've seen a picture like this. I went to the port where they get all these cars, 5,000, 10,000 cars from in a batch, in batches of many, many boats. Uh, and, and then they park them like that. And, and that's where the car journey starts. And it's, it's a massive dealership. They do like 400,000 vehicle a year. And they have very difficult efficiency situations where they need to solve because the margins for dealerships are, as you know, very low. So you have to be really uh, extreme in your efficiencies. So first question I asked when I saw something like this, walking through a sea of cars, where the heck do you put the keys of these cars? <laughs> Without really buying 10,000 boxes or codes or something. And I was really impressed about the way they think about efficiency. So these cars are lined up in a queue, one to 10,000, and every car has a number. And so you just need to hold one key, the first car, and every other car is put in the trunk on the next car. So if you have the first key, you have access to all the cars. So it's a way to solve a problem, really, at no cost. But all these cars move fast, so it's like one after the other, you have five or six drivers driving them, and they know they get used on how to manage that whole key situation. So it puts you in a mode of really thinking out of the box to solve things very efficiently, but also by, by being mindful of cost and being mindful of acceptance and culture and all that. So now uh, I had to travel the country and have to go to Japan, had to go to many places to really understand the journey of this car and to understand what the customer is looking for. The customer is looking for satisfaction of their buyers. How do they love the experience? How do they be repeat buyers? And at the same time, they want to make money, so they want to be extremely efficient. We're able to trace at the high level the car journey, so you can see the car arrives to the port. From there, it's transported to a huge center, a huge parking. It's, it's like it holds about 60,000 cars. And uh, you really don't see the end of it when you walk there. You need to be driving in different cars to see it. And that place has a lot of challenges. Like, these cars can sit there for two months. They have to be rotated all the time. You need to check their batteries. You need to make sure they don't turn into used cars. They're brand new cars. There's definition of a used car versus a brand car done by the manufacturer. So there is a lot of logistics. So if you don't know the whereabouts of these cars very efficiently, and if you don't know their statuses very efficiently, you can be losing a lot of money. You can see even cars sit there for a year or two, and you don't even know they are there. So. We, we, we looked at that, then those cars get dispatched to local distribution centers, to repair shops, and to showrooms. So really the lesson learned here is if you go relentless in terms of understanding your customer experience and understanding the product that you're selling and its journey, it helps you a lot to go after the low-hanging fruits in bringing in efficiencies to the, to the operations. We came up with a dashboard like this, so think about it. I'm just, uh, like you have your full inventory, you can see all the steps of that car journey live as they move every second. You see what arrived to the port, what's being taken from one place to another, uh, going through inspection, all the processes they have to go through. But what's nice about it, if you are running an operation like this and you have visibility, transparency to all that data, it makes you make decisions on the fly and take care of issues as you go. 
Now, another one that Dr. Ast mentioned was getting into collision centers. So collision centers are like big factories, and this is really what would get me excited when I first get exposed to healthcare. There's so many parallels between collision centers and hospitals. It's actually much more difficult to deal with a collision center than a hospital or a surgery center. You have to deal with 3,000 parts from a logistics standpoint to repair a car. A human being, I think there's maybe three or four parts. I'm not an expert, but <laughs> that's the only ones you guys deal with. But uh, it's, it's logistically very difficult to deal with those situations. Also, the parking of the cars, the large number of cars and everything. So. We traced a journey into a workshop. This is an example of a workshop. The, this is their parking when cars arrive. And this is when we turned on IoT, how that same parking looked like. It's like 100% full visibility to anything that car has. Is it repaired? Is it coming for repair? And then we came up with dashboards like this. So inside the workshop, you can see that uh, how many cars have arrived, how much money, this is live as things happen, how much money was committed, uh, how many cars walked out for whatever reason so you can follow through with the, with the customer, what was not approved by the insurance. And then you go through these 12 steps of repairing a car. I think in our industry today, if I look at the ASC market, there's maybe three or four steps uh, without getting into the micro level of the OR, but it's, it's much more simple, much, more, much easier. And, and then at the same time, you, you, you create this dashboard, you give it to the leadership, and they, they see that color coding, which tells you if you are meeting your KPIs or not. If you're green, you're meeting KPI, orange, you're close, and red, you're not meeting it. And as this goes every two milliseconds, you can take actions as the manager of that workshop. So to cross-pollinate these two industries, I think the common denominator, in my view, was vehicle journey versus patient journey. So I, was, I had the great opportunity to meet my two co-founders who are veterans of healthcare, more decades of healthcare uh, industry experience. And when I shared a demonstration of the uh, workshop uh, live, uh, immediately, my French surgeon, Dr. Batra, said, wow, if you can do this in an ASC or in a hospital, this will be fantastic. You're going to solve a lot of problems. And we brought our team and we followed patient journeys end-to-end -end from surgeon office till discharge, till rehab. And we tried to go through a similar exercise within the world of, of the ASC and the hospital. So the th first thing that comes to ma mind is really you've got to focus on the patient journey and make sure if you maximize the time spent caring for patients, that is your biggest win. Everything will come together from there. You optimize the journey and you move the time from time wasted on many other activities that are inefficient to time spent on the patient. You're going to see everything is going to work for you from an ROI standpoint, from a patient satisfaction, from an efficiency standpoint. So we're going back to that, what we talked about for the workshop. Now let's look at how we do that for uh, a patient journey in a surgery center. It is simple. You start with the waiting room, you go to the pre-op, to the OR, recovery, and there you are discharged. The, the first challenge is two different industries, a car sitting in a parking lot exposed to sun, exposed, the, the, the technology doesn't work exactly the same way from a tracking standpoint. So you need to come up with a way to, to track that patient very cost effective. You can do anything if you spend enough money on anything, but how do you bring the tracing of a patient journey to pennies? That was our first challenge to, to see, to create those two parallels. So uh, without, without disrupting the, uh, the process of the hospital or the surgery center, just give me visibility to all my patients every two milliseconds as they while around, walking around or uh, being uh, in, in the surgery center. So the concept of a tag 
has, has been uh, the, the right way to go for us in terms of safety. It's wearable, it's secure, reliable, it's very cost effective, and it provides a great user experience. You really don't need to change any processes inside the surgery center or hospital. You just need to pair that beacon to a patient, and from there, all the magic happens uh, uh, in the background. Uh, we kind of created our little satellite system in a surgery center. It's really simple. It takes about half a day to set up, but it's just these listeners that listen to the bracelet to trace the patient. And then all of this really comes together like an orchestra. I told you, the way, the way we, we have this, these journeys traced is like, that's like the drum beat that's powering an orchestra. And that orchestra, the participant, our audience are the patients and their loved ones. That's who we cater to. But you have the orchestra, which consists of the staff, the nurses, the technicians, physicians, anesthesiologists, vendors. How do we bring all these stakeholders together and in a very simple way and show every one of them what they need to see for the service of that patient journey, for the optimization of that patient journey. So think about it as more like the technology that we try to bring from the uh, auto industry into the surgery center is more or less optimizing that patient journey tracing that patient journey, and now let's look at the challenges we have in healthcare. How do we apply that? Once we solve that problem, we know the whereabouts of the patient. We know all the timestamps of the patient. We collect 20 plus timestamps as the patient move around. How can we make use of that in applications, simple applications that we create ourselves or through partnerships to, to service that patient? Obviously, moving from uh, the healthcare side, to, sorry, from the auto side to healthcare. When, when I met my, my friend, uh, my surgeon friend, uh, he told me, Welcome to healthcare. The problem uh, you used to deal with mechanics, uh, now you're going to have to deal with nurses. Till now, I'm trying to find where the problem is. There's no problem with that. <laughs> I actually love the, uh, the industry and the, the people who work in the industry. He was joking about it, but it's much harder to work in, in the auto industry than in the healthcare industry. And uh, the challenge are really data security, of course. It's not like a car, uh, information about a car or information about a patient, uh, the data privacy and the resistance to, to, to change, which has been huge. I mean, I've never seen resistance to change I've seen in healthcare. Uh, honestly, from my experience, I come from an industry every nine months, uh, we have to innovate, we have to launch products or we die. There's no notion of it. It's the consumer who accepts. Here you have so many layers of acceptance, rightfully, because of the, the nature of the business, uh, because the, 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 this focus on safety, patient safety, data security, and all that, which slows things down. And on top of that, there's a lot of legacy, of course, there, and, and bad taste from technology of the years 2000 and, be, and before, where it was not ready to, to deal with these things. So let's look at the first uh, applications we were able to leverage through tracing the patient journey. So how can we visualize the journey to the family members without nurses touching buttons, without anybody doing anything? It's just automatically patients arrive from their cell phone, they get a text message, and they have the ability to automatically see what's going on with their loved one. That was the first applications that uh, we were able to, uh, to deliver. Uh, and, and really this helped us tremendously in cutting incoming calls into the surgery center uh, by 80%. I mean, many of these calls are viral. You make a phone call, the front desk doesn't know an answer. They escalate to two, three hops. So imagine with that visibility to the family, most of these calls go away. Then we started looking at all the stakeholders. What's next is the staff members. How are we going to reach out to the staff members and make them part of that orchestra? What we did for automotive was something like this. That's what staff members see. That's how they're measured, how they track their performance. 
In the world of an ASC, we created a dashboard inspired from the other one, but dedicated to what these tasks are. So you can see here in a very intuitive way, you can trace a patient journey, you can show the flow of all your patients in a surgery center. Within like 10 seconds, you know what's going on in your center, are the patients in the waiting room, in the pre-op, what's going on in the OR, what's going on in the recovery. A surgeon can see the beds of their patient, they see if their patients are ready to, to see, if uh, they're ready to see the patient. Uh, and you get all these combination of statuses and patients moving around in just one on TV screen and it helps streamline your operation and it helps you manage the flow of these patients efficiently. Uh, this is more a view of that whole dashboard. Now, I would like to use a term used by, by Dr. Charlie de Cook, who the author of 12 by 12, and he, he, he talks about radical time transparency to to, to achieve extreme efficiency. And here it's powered by IoT. By leveraging the internet of things, we're able to trace patient journeys very accurately and visualize the uh, timestamps, the, 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 the every phase of that patient journey. Here's a simple one, waiting room, pre-op, OR, PACU, with the times that on average you should be seeing. And you should be measuring every two milliseconds. And if you see it's taking action, if your pre-op time is 150 minutes, you can instantly know when you exceeded the mark of 45. So I'm going to show you how uh, <laughs> we dive deeper into looking at this journey. These are real patients where uh, in blue is what has been scheduled from an OR uh, time standpoint, and in red, what has been executed. And you can see. Uh, sometimes we're completely outside the mark and sometimes we hit it perfectly. Now, there are technologies out there, uh, like uh, to name a few, like one, one team, there's uh, uh, the ProMap, there's a lot of other technologies I've seen where you can dive deeper into that blue-red segments and see the progress of surgery. So we work with those companies to, 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 to give more visibility, the micro-visibility to the patient journey to, to create more efficiencies. Uh, this is a, a slide where I'm trying to explain a real situation of a, a day of surgery in a surgery center. This is a surgery center of three operating rooms. That day they had three surgeons, and these are 12, I believe there's 12 patients which went through, and that's the sequence of patients coming through the surgery center, and that's the timeline. Uh, the color code shows you how much time they spent in the waiting room, pre-op, Orange is OR and, and green is recovery. And that's the average times for that whole day in terms of time spent. It is not a good day. It's by any measure from the hundreds of thousands of surgeries we've seen, you can do much better than this. Now, let's look at uh, what, what's, what if once you get deep into the analytics of this and start taking action, because you should be able to get instantly how efficient you are. This is, like a, this is like the blood pressure test for a surgery center. I am 20% efficient, like I showed in the earlier slide here. By measuring your scheduling efficiency, it's like a, a blood pressure number for the operations guy. If I am operating at 34%, I'm terrible. I'm costing the center money. And I can tell you how much money you could be costing. If you're operating at 72, you're amazing. You're doing everything you do. I don't think anybody can operate at 99, hitting those kind of windows. So, so going back here, if we just say every surgery is going to start on time, keep the wait time, you're not impacting anything. One factor, just start your surgeries on time. You see the segment under the large segments, that's what is scheduled for starting the surgery. If, you, if you're able to start on time or within 10 minutes of what you committed to, for this day of surgery, for this surgery center, you save 110 minutes for the last patient. So you can close the surgery center 110 minutes before the just operation with zero visibility to what's going on. Physicians, we looked at the three physicians, on average, they leave 65 minutes after their last patient. And this can translate to ROI for the physician and for the surgery center. 
going back to the previous dashboard uh, where I talked about the equivalent of the OR dashboard for the auto industry. Here, I would like to show you what can be done with many suppliers out there right now today with the AI involved. Uh, you can fully visualize your, your, your operating uh, room schedule and power it by IoT and have it refresh every two seconds to tell you what's going on with your operation. Think of, for example, one click and you can look a month down the road and it gives you the optimal way of managing your surgeries, which surgeon, which OR, uh, managing the vendors and all that. This is, this is through all the big data collected uh, is, is, be, is being done. Having visibility to what's going on inside the OR from the vendors, so you avoid all these phone calls. By notifying your vendors, you have the capability to have them see chunks of the day of operation that's relevant to their business. Uh, automatically hiring a nurse, uh, for example, if uh, a month from now or weeks from now you see shortage of staff, you have the capability from an, the intelligent dashboard to escalate this lack of uh, staff and start contacting the right people and getting them accept and getting them show up as staff members like overlaid on this. Uh, now, uh, I want to jump to one, one last slide here where uh, we, we can show the, cap the, the, the utilization of the OR as patients go in and out by surgeon name, by type of specialty. And we can, uh, earlier, there's a, a key, uh, in the previous uh, discussion, there was talk about uh, $20 per minute in the, uh, in the, in the, in, in the uh, ASC. Here, we can overlay every minute cost for every OR because all the data is flowing through that OR dashboard. So there are systems out there where by measuring the uh, patient journey and by calculating all these uh, costs involved from a time of staff and from implants and all that, you can every two milliseconds update your PNL and see what's going on and take corrective actions to optimize your PNL. So I hope this gives you a, a view of my experience uh, trying to go across uh, industries, uh, and thank you very much for the opportunity. Let's have, let's have a seat. Let's, let's chat for a second. I mean, um, that, was, that was fascinating. Again, ha having thank heard you. that story a couple of times, it really does highlight some of the ways that, A, I think healthcare is a challenge because like we didn't learn these lessons a long time ago, but at the same time, it gives us a real opportunity to say that the future, uh, we're gonna do a lot from the inside, but if we bring in some of these ideas from the outside, we can really, uh, we can really make a big difference. Now, you hit on something that you and I love to talk about, which, is, which for a long time no one talked about, and that was staffing. You know, one of the challenges across healthcare right now is staffing, is the challenge of we don't have enough nurses, there's a huge nursing shortage, there's a lot of challenges in staffing and in staffing models and ASCs. And you, you mentioned that if you use the technology correctly, you can sort of change that. What do you think the future of staffing models looks like if you apply the correct technology? I uh, if, if we look at um, the, the big challenge today is what we see a lot with our customers is the ability to staff that OR dashboard and have visibility for, for a few weeks. Uh, the, 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 having the capability to look down like uh, three, four, five weeks and, and knowing what staff members are, are missing, uh, what are, are not committed, what type of specialties are not committed, knowing your pool of resources, having an interface of all, to other systems that are expert in high, bringing that staff, you can instantly, I would say, having the experience of hiring an Uber driver maybe in a couple of years, where you can get the technician you miss, you can get the nurse you miss to staff your, your OR, just because a lot of background work has to be done, of course, in terms of qualifying who that uh, population of staff is, and, and the experience in my view soon would be one click and you'll be able to get 
a bunch of talent you can choose from, and it's a win-win for both sides because you can avoid cancellation of surgeries on one side, and, and you can offer opportunities for staff members to work in different places. Yeah, I, I think it's very interesting to think of it that way, right? We've, again, brick and mortar hospitals and the traditional, the traditional provision of healthcare has been its fixed costs in fixed settings and you sort of deal with those costs. And this is a, obviously a very different way of looking at it and say, no, we only spend the money when we need it and all we need is the technology to be able to spend at the right time. Speaking of spending money, because every single time I talk to my hospital or my healthcare system or other healthcare systems about spending money, the initial answer is no, right? That, that, that's no, it's, it's more money, more money is bad. Not, we, it's, it's not in the budget, we'll put it in the budget. So, and you said something very interesting. While you were speaking, you said, and I'm gonna paraphrase you, I apologize, but you said, you can fix any problem you want if you're willing to spend enough money, right? There's always a way to spend more money, but where's the balance? of throwing money at a problem and responsibly spending that money? And then what's the right economic model to do it for things like technology, in your opinion? I, I think that goes back to the return on investment. Uh, uh, and, and that return on investment could be in terms of financial investment or it could be measured in patient satisfaction. Uh, it could be measured in overall uh, efficiency of staff members. In, in my view, uh, you need to have like financially, that's an easy one to do, and you can do a trial and you can measure those efficiencies and see that you are getting that ROI, that 5X, 10X ROI that you targeted. Uh, or uh, I think you can also uh, look at uh, patient experience, patient outcomes, measure that through trials or through existing uh, testimonials from other uh, partners. So I think the, the decision makers have a lot of tools to, uh, to be able to uh, vet that, those situations and, and spend the money uh, eff efficiently. And do you think there's a particular business model or payment model that works best for these types of technologies that sort of overlie the whole experience. So we always talk about when we start thinking about surgical technology, we talk about is it better for it to have a capital purchase versus a per case purchase, right? In this, these are more like, in my mind, like subscription models, like I pay for Netflix, yes. right? Like I pay for a month and I use it as much as I use it or don't use it and I decide whether it was worth it that month if my kids asked me to pay for something that wasn't on Netflix. Like that's, that's, that's how my life works in my house where we gotta pay for cartoons. But what, what do you think? Is there, a, is there a right model? Is a subscription model? Is a purchase model? Is a capital purchase model? And is it different across centers? I, I think I, I am for like a subscription model, like some sort of recurring revenue for the supplier with recurring impact done by the supplier for the customer. When you purchase a solution and you're paying for that solution monthly, I'm sure you pa it passed the first gate ROI to select that solution, but this should be a journey with your supplier. Your supplier should be giving you recurring impact in efficiencies, in customer satisfaction, in innovation, so you stay with them and you're happy to pay that monthly, whatever it is, a few hundred dollars, a few thousand dollars. I am a proponent of that because that it's a fair balance between what the supplier offers and stay with that partner and, and, and what the partner is getting. And at any time, if that connection is not working, they can sit down and find other ways to fix those issues. That's great. Well, I, I want to thank you again for your time thank this morning. You. I think it was really wonderful. Thank you all for, for your attention. I think we're going to a break now, and I encourage you to find Sleem as he's walking around. If you have any questions, he's a, an incredibly nice guy. And like I said, if you, you get a chance my to pleasure. share dinner with him, you'll enjoy it. Thank you, Dr. Ross. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. Well, that was a great setup. We, we wanted to open the day with a, a broad perspective uh, on the ASC and what happens in the ESC and how things behave in the ESC and what challenges specifically need to be done in the ESC. And I want to thank Mike Ast for doing such a phenomenal job uh, with that uh, and his team, of course.
So as we go into this next session, we're going to be hearing from a number of companies that have solutions specifically applicable to the space of musculoskeletal care as a whole, but also specifically for the ASC. So our first speaker is, is Justin Solomon. Now, I've had a chance to speak with Justin. He's an amazing, amazing doctor. He's an orthopedic surgeon at Mount Sinai. He's also the founder of OutcomeMD. Very, very passionate about this space. And I'm super excited to hear him speak. So Justin, come on up. Oh, and the clicker is... Thank you. Um, lovely to be here, really. So interesting. Uh, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about outcome tracking and try to be efficient here. Uh, the patient actually holds the most valuable and important data. We have billing records and we have EHR records, we have claims data, and what's really missing here are the things that are in the patient's brain. Uh, we're talking about patient reported outcome measures as part of that. These are the medical literature validated question sets. In orthopedics, we're familiar with the Hoos and Coos Jr. probably the most, but there's literally a way to measure every single condition, and it requires sometimes more than one type of patient reported outcome to make up a, an assessment of a, of a condition of a, that means something to a patient. Uh, and I'm not going to get into the details of that, but a combination of promise forms, which you may be familiar with, computer adaptive testing, and the disease-specific um, measures that have been used historically in the medical literature, together can make a fitness tracker-like experience for the patient that I'll show you. And then the data that's missing from that story and from the rest of it is confounding factor data. If I replace your right hip and six months later you break your right ankle, your function is down and your pain is up, and it looks like you had a bad hip replacement. So I don't want my outcomes tracked. If the patient has, is, is work comp or personal injury, I don't want that outcome tracked either because it's gonna make me look bad, right? If the patient's not compliant with non weight bearing status or the sling use, I don't want that outcome tracked, right? You want it tracked. You just want to be able to gather that data along with the patient reported outcome data, structure the information, and create an inclusion and exclusion criteria around the data when you're being judged, right? You want it to be done in a way that can't hurt you and can only help you. And so through ASC integrations, all of this can happen in the background. Patient reported outcome measures done in a way that enhances the patient experience and confounding factor data structured from the patient's brain. Adverse life events and stresses, social determinants of health, laterality, if they have bilateral symptoms and their only status was unilateral surgery, they're never gonna be doing as well, right? So in this brief talk, I'm just going to go through uh, these basic value props for the ASC. The first one we'll talk about is registry submission. Everyone knows about AJRR. This is going to become more and more relevant. And if you want your surgery center to become a center of excellence, and eventually if you want it to be able to do, my guess, at some point joint replacements period, um, you're going to need this. OutcomeMD is the company that, uh, that uh, I'm talking about today. We helped Cedar sinai get a spine center of excellence. There were... Um, 14 reasons why they said they were giving them the, they were the seventh in the country, first in California, center of excellence in spine. Five of those 14 reasons were outcome MD. So like tracking outcomes really does improve outcomes if you're doing it right. Next thing we'll talk about quickly is how this could enhance the patient experience and does enhance the patient experience. So turn patient report outcome measures into a fitness tracker like experience and all of a sudden you get follow up data, long term follow up data because it's interesting to them, right? So what we do is we score their symptoms. This is just a, a symptom score, right? Their shoulder score, made up of the American Shoulder and Elbow Society shoulder score, the Promise Computer Adaptive Test for pain behavior, physical function, and pain interference, all normalized out of 100 and brought together in one number for the patient to keep track of. But you have the theta value from Promise if you want to write a paper. But in the end, the patient is going to follow this one number. So scoring is really important. When they take their follow-up, it looks like this. This is how patients think. Of the improvable range, how much am I gonna achieve, right? And so far, they've achieved 61% in this case. If the patient's gotten worse, it animates like this. They're not surprised, they feel worse. And one second later, their phone rings. Why? Because we sent a notification to your staff that you can set up at different thresholds for different conditions. They get a text, they face ID into our iOS app, and they get to see what's going on with this patient. And they can instantly call them or call them with call ID block. They like to call my patients. They're not texting a minute later. 
This really improves care, and it also makes the surgery center patients feel like the surgery center cares. It was initiated before their surgery center, triggered by HST or SIS integrations or other software integrations. No one's doing anything, but they're reminded to do it before surgery. You get the score before surgery, and then it follows up with them at various time points after surgery. There's no username or password. There's no app to put on the phone. All they do is put in their date of birth, so really seamless. Brand yourself for quality. This is something nobody talks about, but outcome data literally can brand you for quality. What do I mean by that? So besides outcome tracking certified badges and widgets that go on your website, the ASC's website and the provider's website, the ASC website shows all of the great outcomes. Provider's uh, website just shows their great outcomes individually. Okay, these can go at the bottom of the website as a ticker or be embedded within the website. There's dark mode, there's light mode, there's even a colorful mode. But the point here is that you're branding yourself for quality, right? This is a doctor's flex. This is our NFT, right? We, we, uh, my kids will Google me and they'll see some narcotic addicted patient crush me online, right? It feels terrible. And it's not because I wouldn't give them Percocet. They say all sorts of seething things, right? Now my kids Google me and I'm a hero, right? Only patients who have achieved 50% of their approval range show up on your outcome ticker. But it's all of your great outcomes. Why not celebrate those to everyone? I want to repeat that. Only the patients who have achieved at least 50% of their approval range, right? Data to improve care. How am I doing on time? Okay, so this is also really important. Dialing in best practices so that you can deliver the best treatments the first time really comes down to having patient reported outcome data that is, how have the patient's symptoms and quality of life changed over time as a result of these treatments, and uh, data on confounding factors, plus EHR data, which we, we pull in, or the practice management software from the e, uh, surgery center's data, implant data, all of it. You put it all together, you literally can figure out what should be done in the surgery center, what should be done in the hospital. Should we be using Stryker's implant or Smith & Nephew's implant? Should we be using this technique or that technique, right? And, and everything starts to make sense the missing data is the outcome data and the confounding factor data. And without both, they're bo it's confusing. And then helping physicians fill their block time. So remember that while we're, all, we're talking about surgery centers here, it's the physicians who are bringing these cases into the surgery centers. And we are a super emotional, I'm an orthopedic surgeon by training. We're a super emotional group, right? And it's got to resonate with us or we're just not going to adopt it and we're not going to do it. So, and, when we're busier with cases, we fill our block times. Pretty simple. So this is the patient experience when they're getting better, right? They get to see their improvable range. Remember I said the patients who achieve at least 50% of their improvable range is a special thing. We did some studies. They love their doctors, okay? They're bringing you a box of chocolates, a bottle of scotch. So when we see 50% improved or more on a follow-up, and remember the patients are taking this because they get a text, it's, and this is post-op, your previous score is a 23, let's see how you're doing now. And they just have to be curious, in this case a 30. So they click it, they put in their date of birth, that's all they have to do, and they're in. They measure their follow-up score. So we're getting really high follow-up scores, uh, follow-up um, compliance. So if they've achieved 50% of their approval range, one second later after they see their score animate, they see this pop-up, where they can post their great outcome to their own social media or to the doctor's review sites, whichever ones you choose. So when it goes on the patient's own social media, it looks like this. Um, it always is a cathartic event for the patient. We're showing where they were, where they are. Patients are posting left and right. The average Facebook user has 30, uh, uh, 338 friends. So when one of their friends sees this post and it is clicked, it goes to the doctor's website. And it always says special thanks to the doctor, right? This does lead generation and ignites positive word of mouth in your community about your great work. And then if the patient chooses to, instead of post on their own social media, they choose to post on your review sites, we're pushing objective score data into these subjective review sites for the first time in the history of medicine, right? This is a real post. Uh, this is a surgery center in LA. My knee symptom score was 20 before surgery, and my score has improved to 91 so far. Thank you, you know, Doc Surgery Center and Dr. Kabai. That's reputation management. And then ultimately, we're driving business to the doctors who care enough to track outcomes, right? It helps us while we, while we feel like we have to focus on patient catering, it would be really nice if focusing on patient care also drove business to us, right? Um, and the star rating is, if you really want my opinion, I think it was a pretty big mistake for us to go down this road. I mean, it's great for restaurants, but super toxic for healthcare because 
you need an outcome, you need a cure, you, know, you don't need a friend when you go to a doctor. Um, but instead, we, we hyper-focus on delivering satisfaction. I mean, every patient-doctor interaction has an air of blackmail, right? I mean, they got you. You kind of have to satisfy them. Order the unnecessary MRI when they just sprain their MCL. Because if you don't, your business model's in trouble. So anyway, this goes against that, and what we're doing is we're celebrating the doctors who care enough to track outcomes and showing the data, and this doesn't show, but showing the data in a way where the doctor wins and can't lose. We also drive keywords in your geography to this site. So if you're not certified, you can get certified. Just track outcomes. And if you are certified, you're blown up with business. Uh, so this is, this is live in some geographies right now, uh, outcome ratings. The point here is the surgeons at a surgery center that has adopted this tech get way busier for doing the right thing and you have data to improve care. And I'm actually early, so um, I'll give you time back or answer questions. Or... This is fantastic. You've done I have a bunch of questions for you, so we've got four minutes, which is fantastic. All right, so I have a question for you. As an interpreter, you've been doing this for a while. This is not one year, right? Yeah, no, the company was started in 2016. Yeah, 2016, and you had to learn an awful lot. Tell me what your great best insights, like you, ideas, things that you would tell your younger self, like, by the way, this is the way this works, that you would think... Yeah, you know, I think some early focusing, like, you have to empathize with what it feels like to be a doctor, you know, in order to make things work. If we're saying, look, hey, change behavior, track outcomes, and pay for the privilege of doing so. Like, good luck getting anyone to do that, right? So every attempt at outcome tracking, it's sort of like with a stick instead of a carrot. Um, and so I really think empathizing with a physician is key, and then delivering something to the patient that's, that's two things. They'll do it if it's, one, interesting to them, right? And we're gamifying that patient experience way further with all sorts of cool badges and things that just make them want to get better. They have a timeline visualization of care that brings in all the electronic medical record endpoints and plots them on the graph. And the other reason that patients do it is because their physicians are asking them to do it. And when I say that, you don't have to do anything, okay? You, if you're using it in the office, you just have your staff, okay, somebody, can actually say, hey, we really want you to do this. When the patients hear that, they feel like you're using the information to improve care, and it actually is decision support from day one. If an orthopedic surgeon's using it in their office, we don't have time to ask the perfect questions, right? So we just kind of assume they're symptomatic. And we know the story that x-rays of arthritis don't correlate with symptoms always. But you can get any patient to get a knee replacement if you pop up their end-stage arthritis, right? But you don't want to operate on that person who doesn't have symptoms because they're not going to feel better afterwards, right? Um, and you do want to operate on the, the one that's afraid of getting a surgery but has horrible symptoms. This helps you operate on the ones who need it and not operate on the ones who don't. The data informs care all the way through. I'm not answering all of your questions. <laughs> but it's, it's an interesting question, Mark. Like you've, you've really pointed out how useful it can be to triage, because you have 15 minutes, you're gonna make a quick decision, but this information can add additional value. Um, um, gamification is something we spoke about at last year's Doc SF. We had a person who works in the gaming industry come speak to us, and that, that, that is still very much in line, and he talked about the massive business model. Um, and the, the, the idea of integrating a feedback loop into the care model is something that you've obviously done well. So where, where, when you've, as you've used it, where have you found, what have you found the key elements of that? Because I, I know what I've heard elsewhere, but what you found to be most uh, useful to drive patients to continue to engage with your platform? Yeah, I think the fitness tracker-like experience is really important, and it has to be understandable. Like, PRO data is just not, even the doctors can't really understand it. One scale is from 5 to 42. The next one is a negative 1.46 theta value. You know, like, what does any of that mean? You have to hire your statistician to write the paper, right, because you don't really know what's happening here. So we've done a lot of math, but it's just math, right, to take the raw data and more than one PRO to come up with a condition score, really for every condition in medicine, and then make that into something that is understandable instantly to the clinician and patient alike, and then bring in, like I was saying before, all the medical record endpoints, medications, procedures, diagnoses, implants, whatever, plot them on the patient's timeline in the past and in the future, and then show how their symptoms and quality of life have changed over time. And they start to realize, oh, I stopped physical therapy and I'm worse. And then when I start physical therapy, I get better. I guess I should go back into physical therapy, right? Or whatever the case may be. You know, I did a, a research project where we gave people sensors all over the place and someone just 
come back and I've lost that one or I haven't plugged it in, but there's one that they always wore. And, like, and they're like, why, do, why is this the one? So I can understand what it's telling me. Is it synthetic? Yeah, absolutely. Making the, in, the output understandable to the user is massively important. I love what you did there with that percentage score. I have one last question. Um, and it, uh, were you here this morning when I spoke about the mobility outcome measure? Yes. Absolutely. So that idea is how do you create an, an objective outcome measure? But to me, it's only half the equation. The other half is the patient's perception of wellness. Now, we as physicians are like, I don't want to be... I don't want to be rated on the patient's perception of the work I did because so many variables go into beyond the surgery. So I think we'll address that with the objective measure function. But what do you think of that idea, that yeah, me that having question. both of those? So patient portal outcome measures are actually objective. Okay. The reason they're objective is because they are, they've been validated in the medical literature compared against other ways to determine an outcome. MRI change, x-ray change, lab value change, physical exam change. And if they don't correlate, they throw them out and write new questions. This has been happening for the last 135 years. So the, that number is something real, as long as you have an unbiased sampling of patients and good follow-up, okay? Which is not always the case. Like you talk to AJRR, their follow-up rates are really bad across the board. So we need to do a better job of getting real fair and real data. And then you have to have the confounding factors to correlate it with. Then all the other data is also interesting though, why not, right? Bring in some sort of a mobility number but the way you validate the mobility number is by comparing it to the patient report outcome measure. Because the medical literature, like that is kind of Western medicine at this point, right? All For right. every condition in medicine. Thank you so much, Justin yeah. Solomon. Thank you. Amazing work. 10 years of effort. Oh, thank you. And the clicker, yeah. Super. Next is Neil Brannon. And uh, Neil Brand is coming to us from Clarify Health Solutions. And Neil actually is fascinating. He um, is the chief analytics officer at, um, at Clarify Health and formerly a chief data officer at CMS under the Obama administration. And he and I met famously on a panel where we went back and forth. Uh, it was a battle of the wills on stage. Actually, we had a lot of fun with that. But thank you for coming back and tell us a little bit about challenging the status quo, quo status quo with Behavioral economics. Pick it up. Uh, hi, hi, everybody. Uh, it's great to be here. Um, thank you for uh, having me back, Stefano. I still remember that panel. It was a lot of fun because it was you, me, and Goran. From, um, from from Coventry, so it was a lot of uh, a lot of strong uh, personalities uh, on that panel. <laughs> um, so uh, I want to talk to you. It's interesting. The previous speaker, you know, the the conversation came up about uh, carrots and sticks, and uh, I think we can uh, all uh, agree. Well, I hope that there's a, there's a lot of uh, sticks in uh, in traditional uh, healthcare, particularly when it comes to dealing with um, with payers and you know new value-based care models and uh, and different things like that. So we've um, <clears throat> recently been testing uh, a more uh, carrot-based uh, approach uh, that has had uh, pretty uh, exceptional results uh, in in three metropolitan areas um, uh, around the country, and uh, it's uh, focused. Uh, on um, <clears throat> orthopedic, uh, orthopedic care, um, specifically um, hip and knee surgeries, and incentivizing um, uh, surgeons to, uh, to shift from uh, inpatient and outpatient settings to, um, to ASC. So just you know, setting up the, um, uh, the, the framing here, you know, there's a lot of talk about value-based care, a lot of talk about value-based payment. They tend to be fairly blunt um, instruments. I think they create a lot of frustration for uh, providers and, you know, frankly, uh, payers don't uh, like them that much better. It's one of those things that, like, sounds great when you, like, describe it and then you actually have to implement it and it turns into a massive pain in the ass for everybody. So, uh, and then, but, like, the old school kind of UM stuff is, like, even worse, right? So how do we uh, try and navigate between these two worlds? And so, um, uh, as Stefano said, I'm at Clarify Health. <clears throat> um, last year, we um, uh, acquired a company uh, that was founded by uh, Zeke Emanuel and um, Amal um, Navath. Uh, and they, uh, Amal in particular, is a huge um, student and believer and aficionado of, uh, of using behavioral incentives to, um, uh, to make uh, positive change um, occur. And um, so, 
what we um, do um, uh, via this program, and I, and I will get uh, into details, is we, um, we're working with a major national payer, uh, and we, you know, um, go into markets working um, mostly with uh, with independent surgeons, and you know this kind of represents you know a little bit of the you know this is the the sort of academic uh, construct for um, for what we do um, enrollment sort of laying out uh, the value proposition and the um, uh, the, the, the potential incentives available um, um, onboard the physicians uh, work with them to. Um, uh, to sort of track um, their care and their performance. Uh, again, this has done a lot of, um, uh, you know, provider performance and peer comparisons have been a little stickish in the past, um, but um, we've, we, we've done this in a more, you know, there, it, it, it's, it, it's more fun to receive provider comparisons when you know that if you do a little better, you'll actually get um, get paid more instead of getting dinged or a bad like review on Google or you know told that you're um, you're not on the preferred uh, preferred network uh, of physicians um, another thing um, that um, that we find um, is very effective is um, value-based care, like traditional value-based care programs are very um, retrospective and lagged. So like you do a bunch of work and then at the end of the year, you may or may not get a check. Uh, we're, we're constantly um, working with physicians and they're getting um, incentive payments uh, on a very, uh, at a very frequent basis, uh, usually um, monthly. And so now we're working to, um, uh, to expand um, the program. So how does this this look for um, an orthopedic surgeon. Um, instead of requiring uh, multiple layers of authorizations, um, we give them incentives and goals. Um, we personalize the recommendations based on their, the way they practice um, and, and their historical practice patterns for their patients. We give them quarterly incentive dollars. Uh, we also incentiv incentivize the staff um, at these surgical practices because um, the staff are obviously a, 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 key, uh, a key engagement point. And then we give um, regular monthly feedback on not only how much they um, are making in incentives, but because we're switching um, um, site of service, I mean, you guys all know this, um, it's really sort of better for everybody, including patients um, who are um, saving money via, via co-pays and different things like that. So um, <clears throat> how does it work? Uh, we tested it in three MSAs, uh, and uh, we had a, a control group uh, in an additional four MSAs. And so what we found in our, in our intervention group, while both groups sort of reflected this like sort of secular trend towards um, more of this um, stuff happening in, um, uh, in ASCs, uh, the intervention group uh, significantly um, uh, outperformed uh, the control groups uh, in terms of switching to preferred um, sites of service, and it uh, generated um, uh, significant uh, value. So uh, on average, um, uh, spending for, for these surgeries um, uh, decreased uh, by 12% uh, compared to the uh, um, compared to the to the average, and but even more, it was actually a 22% uh, differential relative to the control group because the control group actually got uh, a, a little bit more um, a little bit more expensive. So um, it's you know very um, uh, bespoke. Uh, we have on the ground um, coaches working directly uh, with the um, uh, with the orthopedic uh, with the orthopedic groups. Um, so um, there's a lot of um, a lot of personalization, um, uh, a lot of uh, email outreach. Uh, I'm not really an expert in these things, but um, apparently our email open rates are like really high. They're like you know high 70 percent. So like it, there's like really strong um, engagement um, from the practices and really strong engagement from um, from from the physicians uh, involved. Um, the uh, another thing to just note is we um, we enrolled about um, 90 uh, physicians um, initially. Uh, that was about a year and a half ago, and we had a 100% a renewal rate um, with the first um, <clears throat> 90 surgeons, and we've um, now expanded it to uh, 225 uh, surgeons. Uh, so um, and people seem to, um, you know like it, stay, and now it's um, expanding uh, <clears throat> and scaling. So 
um, you know, some more um, uh, bottom line um, numbers. I, I already mentioned the 100% the uh, renewal rate, 79% um, uh, engagement, 14% uh, gain in enrollee preferred behavior uh, compared to uh, the control groups. Um, the average, um, um, the, it, on average, there's about 30,000 in, in, in savings with um, 8,000 in savings um, going uh, to the surgeon. That's based on roughly um, uh, about, about 10 procedures. And so remember, this is one pair. Um, um, you know, just one pair for, 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 for each surgeon. So if this, you know, could scale um, across uh, multiple payers, I mean, I guess it depends on your outlook in life if you think $8,000 is a lot of money or not a lot of money at all. But um, uh, people seem uh, to, um, uh, to really like it. And so um, that is uh, actually it. I flew through that, Stefano. Um, I hope that's okay. Um, and, but I'm happy to answer um, questions. Or, or different things like that. Great, thank you very much. <laughs> Neil, um, $8,000 was per year? Per yes. physician? Per insurer? Yeah. Um, just to clarify that. Um, the micro incentives, what, what kind of micro incentives are there? I mean, you, you mentioned that, but you didn't tell us what they are. Yeah, so they, they range, um, so, so literally, um, well, there's, there's micro incentives and there's macro incentives. So the macro incentive is if you switch the surgery, we will give you $1,000. Um, the, the micro incentives, um, and one thing I failed to mention is we're, we're doing this beyond um, just um, orthopedic surgery, so we're expanding into um, uh, GI care, um, and then sort of something completely different and less interventional, um, I'm trying to um, incent specialty um, referral um, behavior change. So some of the micro incentives are, don't laugh, um, Starbucks gift cards for office staff and different things like that. And the crazy thing is, is that they work. Um, and so, so just be clear, uh, you get the, the Starbucks card to do what behavior? Well, so for, 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 for the office staff, it's to kind of uh, keep um, the, the surgeons engaged and um, excited about, you know, the program and different things like that. That's interesting. It's also looking at the support staff and make sure that yes. the physicians are engaged and those yes. using some incentives in that space. Um, and, and, like, and that's, you know, again, practically speaking, that's the point of entry for, you know, for, for our, our, our coaches. And, you know, they do a great job of building relationships. But like the first, uh, the first interaction is rarely, you know, with the surgeon. It's with like the office staff and you have to sell it. You have to produce the use cases. You have to show the impact on the bottom line. And then we eventually get to, uh, to the surgeons who make the call. Hmm, interesting. So um, let's talk a little bit about the, um the details of how you, this actually happens. What integration has to happen? What is an EMR based thing? Is it a, how do you, today we, I sign up and we're, we're gonna do this. What happens next? Um, so it's, it's not necessarily um, um, EMR based integration is needed per se. Um, uh, we are, we, we do like to, you know, obviously look at the data very closely and make sure that like, you know, outcomes are improved and different things like that. But it, it sort of is a, a little bit of a standalone um, program. It's digital in the sense that it's like highly bespoke. There's a lot of engagement, um, uh, different things like that. But um, we mostly um, actually, um, you know, um, sort of um, um, spin the program up uh, and create opportunity analyses and sort of present what the uh, potential uh, upside is using uh, claims data. Using claims data. So you, this is a, sorry, I just want to get down to the nuts and bolts of this thing. It's an, I get an email every day or I get, you, this patient, you could do it outpatient, you've booked it as yes. an inpatient, why don't you rebook it, that kind of thing? Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. So it's a communication platform, if you yes. will, that gets integrated. Once I say yes, okay, we're gonna start sending you emails. We we know what you're booking because we're the insurer. We're paying for it, but we're gonna make some suggestions, and mostly yes. it's out of care. And yeah. then you do these micro incentives. Okay. Big picture, probably a lot of the audience asks. It's a it's a fixed pie. Mm -hmm. um, 
these things, we always talk about this race to the bottom business. Yep. Uh, these incentives go away once everybody standardizes to a protocol. Yep. How does that, uh, how does that play out for us? Why would we be incentivized, we as physicians, we as VACs, to, to go along with this and, and decrease the cost to the insurer? So uh, it's a great question. Um, again, uh, from uh, uh, a, a sort of a, a purely revenue generating perspective, um, at least in the short term, there is significant um, upside in this for, for, for physicians. Where we where we go once you know all the hips and knees um, are at ASCs is a is an interesting question. But again, like I said, I think there's lots of different um, other um, areas of healthcare where we can um, apply uh, these nudges and incentives. And like, look, yeah. like you, you know, I was kind of like when they. Um, when they first like explained the, the the program to me, like sometimes it's like the the simplest things that actually work. I mean, we've you know we can go back to we can look at the you know the healthcare cost trend and it's just been up and up and up and up and up and up and up forever. And I'm not saying that this is single-handedly you know bending the cost curve, but it is actually tangibly reducing um, the cost of care. Um, and so if it plateaus in two or three years when all the behavior change um, has been um, achieved, maybe that's okay. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we'll try and, you know, move along and fix another problem. <laughs> no, exactly. And I think I, I was pushing a little bit there. I think yeah. absolutely the, one of the onuses on us is, the, is to figure out a way of decreasing costs and putting the, in the lowest cost, highest quality, lowest cost. Yes. Medium. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Okay, now Matt, where are you? Matt Troop, there he is. Oh, we're, we, we never got a bio from you, so I'm gonna have you stand up for a second and tell us, have, help me tell our audience um, who you are. Um, but I know you're coming from Memorial Health, which we're very excited about, but yeah. uh, what do you do there? Yeah, that's right, uh, medical director at Memorial Health um, and joined about uh, 15 months ago, uh, practicing as a PA for about 12 years and now just helping design a digital solution that, uh, yeah, really is a, a, a great product for both patients and clinicians at the same time. Awesome, so you gotta tell us a little bit about it, so welcome to the yeah. stage. thanks Dr. Benny. Yeah, so my background again is as a, as a PA and, oh, cool. yes, that will be important. Perfect. I spent the last 12 years in hospital medicine. Uh, over the course of the last five or six years, got really involved in transitions of care processes, trying to understand how we can better support patients at the time that they transition from a hospital or surgical center back home. Understanding the pitfalls that happen for patients during this journey and how we can really set them up for success in a better way. But over the course of that time, doing a lot of work in clinical quality and clinical outcomes, realizing the digital solutions we have at the time right now aren't giving us the success that we need. It doesn't feel like they're built in the right way to deliver that care. And during the COVID pandemic, it was an even more realization that we need to build better tools to ensure the success of patients once they return home. So today, I wanna to talk a little bit about going beyond the chatbot and how we can use conversational AI to really augment care and extend extend the reach of care teams beyond the hospital walls, beyond the surgical center walls. So a bit of the agenda, but I promise we'll go quickly. Uh, and we'll move on. So the current state of care delivery, I, I think of you know, how we're trying to set patients up for success, but honestly, healthcare is really complex. We know that we intend for patients to follow this singular line from diagnosis to treatment to uh, to, com to a path to resolution, but it's a hard line for patients sometimes to follow. There's a lot of pitfalls that happen along the way. Navigating that surgical journey can be, uh, can be intense for patients. It's fraught with barriers to care that prevent patients from even getting to the surgical center to begin with, and then all the, the roadblocks that happen after surgery to really set them up for success. And if we believe in this patient-centered care model, there's a lot that goes into ensuring that success for patients. Everything that happens preoperatively, from getting them the, the appointment reminders they need and instructions to prep them for, for the best outcomes possible, getting them the, addressing the barriers to care that might exist, all the way through post-operative uh, guidance, transitions of care, prom collection and, and reporting that we've talked about a lot today, heard a lot about today, 
and then benchmarking satisfaction. There's a lot that goes into that, and really, a lot of that is manual tasks right now. These manual tasks that require a lot of different stakeholders from your, from your care teams, and largely are manual in, uh, in nature. And if we believe that effective communication is at the heart of this process to really set patients up for success, to enable that behavior change, to activate them into uh, this self-management that promotes better outcomes, it requires a lot of our time and energy. And the impact is significant. Um, I'm sure you've all read the recent study, but 63% of physicians are reporting symptoms of burnout. Since the COVID pandemic, greater than 60% of nurses are uh, considering resigning from, from healthcare. Um, and then, of course, the impact of that is the upcoming staffing shortages that the projections are quite significant. Is technology the answer? Uh, well, technology, in a lot of ways, has missed the mark. I wonder if any of you really love your EHR. I suspect that might not be true. Um, and, that's, and that's where I'm at now. And it's great to be at a place where a lot of people see the, uh, understand that the intersection of technology and healthcare represents an opportunity, but in a lot of ways, technology has failed so far. Um, I have two young kids, they're boys, they fight all the time, and often my house represents the outcome of that fighting. I get a lot of holes on my walls, and so every time I have to go repair the drywall, I pull out my tool, tool kit, and I feel like technology right now in healthcare is like pulling out a toolbox, and it's full of kitchen utensils. And I have to repair this hole in the wall with a spatula, and a cheese grater, and a turkey baster, and like these, these tools can get the job done, but they're not the right tools for the job. And so what we need to do in technology is create better tools. Because they've fallen flat so far, we've created additional friction in workflows, we've seen poor adoption, we've seen unintegrated tools that create siloed communication, and oftentimes we're helping one end user at the expense of another end user. We might have a really good patient engagement tool, but it's creating more burden on care teams. And the representation of that is staggering. We see that in-baskets are overflowing. We see a 157% increase in in-basket messaging since the pandemic. And every one of those in-basket messages takes over two minutes to complete. And I'm thankful to all of your care teams who are probably back at the office filling in your in-basket messages and sending those out for you. Or maybe you did that at the break here. But it's become unsustainable, really. Oh. A little messy there. Uh, but the impact of that is that the in-basket messages are impacting clinician satisfaction and phys physician satisfaction. And so something needs to be done. And that's where conversational AI, I believe, can really move the needle here. For intelligently enabling care teams to have an opportunity to automate a lot of these tasks and set patients up for success. We're all familiar with the chatbot. <laughs> I just yesterday received a message from United Airlines telling me about my flight to San Francisco. It was helpful, but if I responded to that message, nothing happens. And that's okay, because in the airline industry, I don't require a lot from United Airlines to get to San Francisco besides knowing when to get on the plane. Healthcare is different. It's more complex, and there's a lot more at stake. So we need to build a platform, a chatbot, that goes beyond what we consider to be industry standard. It's more dynamic, it's conversational, it's providing patients with 24-hour access to guidance in an automated fashion, but not at the expense of care team's time and energy. And really the reduction of manual tasks through automation, providing better visibility into that patient journey, uh, providing patients with that soft landing after surgery, and then escalating, the, escalating any urgent issues to care teams at the right time. I loved uh, Dennis Boyle's conversation yesterday from IDEO, and he said that in the design thinking, you really have to start with empathy. And the best digital tools, I truly believe, start with empathy by understanding the problem. And so we're really looking to understand the problem. I'm trying to solve for my own frustrations that I had in my own clinical practice and try to bring back the joy of, of, uh, of doing clinical practice. It's a privilege, really, and we need to reinstill that for, um, for our teams. This is an uh, example from a recent peer-reviewed study that Memorial Health released. Uh, looked at utilizing a chatbot to help support patients in the 
post-operative uh, setting for a hip arthro ar arthroscopy surgery. Uh, they named their chatbot Felix. And the importance here is that we saw good clinical outcomes from this study, but more importantly, what I want to highlight here is the fact that you'll see, it's a little difficult to see, but 80% of patients agreed or strongly agreed that this chatbot, Felix, helped them, uh, helped them manage their condition better at home. And then the surgeons involved in this study strongly agreed that they would be happy to use Felix again for, their, for the care of their patients and recommend it to other surgeons. So we're a solution that actually uplifts and improves the experience of both clinicians and the patients at the same time. At scale, we've seen this in a different capacity at Memora. We have, long, have a long-standing postpartum program um, that we see a multitude of patients go through every year. It's a high-touch high touch phase of care journey, just like uh, post-operative surgery is. Requires a lot of manual and, and uh, engagement from clinical teams, but utilizing uh, the chatbot in this case, a conversational AI texting platform, we saw improved engagement across patient, the patient population. Patients felt as though the, the chatbot was reliable, helpful, comprehensive, and kind of below the screen, you can't see that part, but we had a program NPS of 80, which in industry standards is considered world class. Patients really loved and trusted that this platform had their best, uh, their best intentions in mind. And we saw that across the board, regardless of socioeconomic status, uh, race or ethnicity, that patients had the similar outcomes in their care. So that's great, but what does it actually do for care teams? It unburdens the care team. So we saw that 97% of text messages were automated uh, by, the, by Memora's platform. I think over the course of last year, uh, we saw 30,000 automated texts sent to patients and only 100 text, ma manual texts sent by clin clinical teams. And if you think back to that slide where we talked about two minutes per in-basket message, 30,000 messages over the course of a year, that really adds up. And that's a lot of burden on your clinical teams. And so what that resulted in is 7,000 hours of estimated time savings for the care teams. And again, can't see it down there, but the projected cost savings of that was $370,000 over the course of one year. So the future of care delivery, in my opinion, this is one component of that. We talked a lot today about how a lot of these technologies need to work together, uh, synergies between them to really improve the future of care delivery. But specifically around intelligent care enablement, it's providing a better connection between patients and their care teams, leveraging technology to provide that more longitudinal view to care, and removing tasks and giving time back to clinical teams. This is what the future could look like with technology. This is what gets me excited, gets me up every day. It's why I want to come here and hear from Dr. Benny all the time. But what does success really look like? Yeah, it's great to see the clinical outcomes, the reduced burden we've seen on care teams. But at the end of the, end of the day, we still want our patients to feel like they have a positive experience. And that's what we're seeing because patients aren't seeking more care. They're seeking better, more focused care they want to feel heard, they want to feel understood, and they want to see the path to recovery. And technology gives that to patients when we unburden the care teams from repetitive, mundane tasks, let you provide outstanding care, but not at the expense of time and increased burnout. Technology can give that to patients and care teams when we give the right tool to the right care team member at the right time. So, thank you. You can hold on to that, Matt. I, I, uh, I'm a big fan of Memora. You guys have done great. By the way, in Thanks. this environment, because of their vision and their thinking, they actually did a big raise just recently, which is impressive. Um, one of the things I loved about the way they, uh, they approached the problem, he didn't get into this, at least it's the, the DNA of the company, is they would, instead of taking a Boolean algorithm, which is the ones that all our nursing hospital systems have, you call the hospital and the nurse has a bunch of questions and depending on the answer, it throws out, an, uh, you either go to the clinic or you get an answer, take a Tylenol. They would ingest, we're using the natural language processing platform, the information that your clinic 
normally gives to patients. This is your information. They could actually even take the voice files from your um, uh, automated phone systems and take that data set and use that to give the information back to the patient. It's a very customized approach. It wasn't Boolean, it was driven by NLP. Now this additional conversational AI piece is really fascinating because now you're taking it to the next level. And I've always felt this to be probably one of the uh, better applications of AI because you are in fact able to eliminate a, a large percentage of those calls coming into the practice. We um, use a competitive uh, company that's not quite as efficient and we just turned off the two-way communication piece uh, because it was generating too much work for our staff. So a couple of questions for you though. There is uh, probably in the audience a good uh, number of folks who are saying, okay, this is great. So I get to a certain point where I'm going back and forth on my conversational AI, and it gets a little murky. Is this the AI practicing medicine, or is it doing the right thing? Where, at what point, and how do you decide what questions need to be escalated? Yeah, that's such a great question, and a line that definitely needs to be decided upon. And we are software as a service, not software as a medical device. We are not offering patients uh, any, doing any medical decision making on behalf of the care teams. But what we're providing Disclaimer is. Disclaimer done. Now yeah. Does what the <laughs> yeah, I guess that's true. Uh, what we're actually doing is, is providing a, a stream of communication back to the care team so they understand pretty much every data point that exists between clinic visit and clinic visit. Uh, when a patient gets discharged from an ASC and has their next follow up visit at some point in time in the future, and screening for patients for symptoms and collecting those, those proms and checking in, checking in with them on an automated basis, and then understanding when there's a, when there's a threshold that's met, when there's a concern that is generated, automatically populating that back to the care team through an integration with their EHRs um, and just making sure that it's a, it's a seamless notification process. And then through the same stream of communication, we prioritize SMS text for all the delivery of our messaging at any point in time, a clinical staff member can jump into that stream of messaging and start to uh, text with that patient directly. So it's really this hybrid approach to how we're, we're messaging patients that really feel, uh, makes patients feel like they have this always-on, actionable platform for their care. Thank you, Matt. Yeah. That was awesome. Appreciate Thank it. you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So taking technology and applying it into our real world, uh, as we just heard using conversational AI, um, also comes in the form of applying AI platform, intelligent platforms, into our visual field of work. And I think that one of the, com the companies coming up next, uh, which is going to be represented by my friend Edouard Saget, is uh, coming up, um, is really done an amazing job of taking this concept uh, to a, a really fine art. Um, and one of the things I love about the way they're applying AI is, in my way, and my, my understanding of it, the way I see it, is that you're really thinking one step ahead. So tell us more about that. Edouard Sajé. Yeah, thank you, Steph. That's not exactly what I got. <laughs> um, all right, I'll play it. This is one minute going through the Atlantic Ocean. Sunset and the big waves. A lot of fun surfing. So um, what enabled our peace of mind when we crossed the Atlantic? This guy. This is called navigation with autopilot. And it's fascinating what it does for you. First of all, it does much better job of human as fine movement, maintains their heading like nobody's business, doesn't require humans, so it's very efficient. Less fatigue on us, we were able to hang out. Uh, and the time saving is important from point A to point B because there was a boat rental cost attached to it. And no, it didn't take one minute, 
uh, but 18 days for us to cross, and it was in a relative peace of mind. So even sailboats have automation. Um, so we are orthogrid, not clarify, and I want to talk to you about AI-powered navigation system and ESCs. Uh, the maximizing the value in ESC really is about clinical performance and sustainable cost management. Um, a few years ago at DocSF, BTS uh, said something interesting. Technology is not in itself a solution. Really, uh, the question they asked was, what problem are you trying to solve for which a solution exists in technology? And that changed my thinking on how we were approaching uh, development of technology. So what are the different problems, right? Well, different problems are different solutions. If you want to automate gesture, maybe you need a robot. If you want to automate surgeons' brain work in our end, and our thought process and design, we need to look at AI. And in a navigation space, you can't ignore that thoroscopy is probably the number one navigation system. It's used in a lot of orthopedic procedures. So where there is thoroscopy, there may be an app. Thoroscopy in total hips is almost over 45% of the market, all that in the same time that robot is coming along. So what happens in fluoroscopy, you have a lot of different aspects going on. You get a fluoroscopy workflow happening, and this is what's going on in your operating room. So what are the problems in that workflow? You've got to identify them. Quality, assurance, clinical, or efficiency. All those things are perfect for AI. And AI can bring reproducibility, time savings, cost uh, uh, optimization, and peace of mind. How do you build AI? You all probably should know that, but there's data that you need, machine learning, deep learning. At the end, you end up with something called a neural network. And that neural network is actually um, pretty narrow-minded. Uh, and it uh, provides certain pieces of the puzzle, and I call them bricks of technology. So how do you reproduce human brain work um, with uh, AI? You got to put these pieces together in a certain order and to do certain things at the right time. So if you look at uh, a surgical workflow, again, with fluoroscopy, you take into account scene interpretation, anatomy, uh, and you provide the physician what and the team what they need to have at the moment they, they want it, and not specifically all the uh, fine-tuning behind it, but uh, how do they want it, what kind of format do they want it, what information do they want it, and you just provide it to them you know, uh, uh, immediately. No pins, no setup, almost no human at this time. So patient care requires quality assurance. So if you're a surgeon and you like to plan your case, you like to execute, execute that case, as well as making sure that your outcomes are going to match that planning. Error prevention and catching is an interesting feature of AI for quality assurance. At the end, all are looking for better patient outcomes. But a navigation system needs to optimize surgical efficiency. So pre-trained models are very interesting because they are in synergy with the surgeon. They're looking to augment that surgeon. So it's a seamless adoption. I'm going to let surgeon talk about that a little bit since I have some videos. Uh, this is Dr. Glenick. He's doing the AI uh, uh, on the cup side for efficiency and quality assurance. From the antiversion standpoint, I like my 40 degrees of inclination. So we're going to finalize putting this cup down. And that, I think, is the beauty of using this, uh, these two devices together, kind of automated impaction with the OrthoGrid software, because it allows you to fine-tune your cup position in real time. X-ray. Again, notice those blue lines on the, on this, on the OrthoGrid screen in there, um, t telling us that our cup or our pelvic position has not changed much. So we know we can trust this position of the acetabulum. If we look at uh, reproducibility and accuracy, Dr. Gillen in here show you a quick video of how leg length and offset with AI uh, works. So there's our intraoperative fluoro, again neutral in terms of our limb lengths. Here we are post-op, and I've drawn this trans teardrop line, and so as best as I can tell, her teardrops are very difficult to tell because of this protrusio and, and, this, and the weird sort of uh, osteophyte she has. But you can see that's a pretty good line with the bottom of her obturators, pretty good line at the bottom of her ischia, and so I'll take that as a, as a reasonable line. Limb lengths, we look spot on in terms of side to side. So I'll, I'll accept that that neutral was right. So the AI was telling us what we needed to. Another setting is Dr. Stewart actually was the first one to use the AI plus FDA clearance uh, and uh, used it um, in a complex conversion revision hit. Today we're using workflow grid with the AI enhancement to do several cases. And we finished the day up with a more complicated case. In a revision, and so we used it for planning the cup, 
putting the leg length and offset. And in a case like this, where there's a lot that we want to change, this patient's starting tremendously short. That's the sort of thing that's hard to estimate on your own. This achieved all our goals quickly, efficiently, and let us do some things that are out of the normal workflow, but it didn't take extra time. It was really quite efficient. So an excellent use uh, for our first day with OrthoGrid and the AI enhancement. Yep, that was on the first day. Um, another thing to think about about AI is that we train on procedural context. So if you have a specific surgical technique as a surgeon, I'm not going to ask you to change it. I'm going to try to augment it. So uh, Dr. Yarsimides used a very specific technique, different than the other surgeons related to hip overlay, and there's a shortage on this paper that you see in the back. The flow is very easy. It's very, very easy to learn. There's not a hundred buttons to push. Um, the, this particular program, you know, the AI overlay program, it automatically changes from one scene to the next scene to the next scene without somebody having to be there to guide it. It's self-guiding. Um, and it's an outstanding program and I highly recommend anybody that uses an overlay technique. Um, the other thing about these bricks of technologies, you know, those red, yellow, and blue, they actually can be transported and used for other applications. So we're not stuck in a total hip world. We can use them for hip preservation. For example, uh, that technology was studied by the team of Dr. Peters and got a John Charney Award for it uh, and its results. So that's very interesting. But Dr. Mike Ryan uses them all. Hey guys, it's Dr. Mike Ryan from Birmingham, Alabama. Just want to let you know we have OrthoGrid here in the room. This thing's awesome. We use it for a lot of our surgeries, including anterior total hip replacements with the new AI. Uh, I use it for hip preservation for PAOs, surgical hip dislocations, and also for hip arthroscopy. This thing's awesome. You gotta check it out. Gotta get the OR. It makes things super efficient, super accurate. So uh, when you're trying to, I don't want to be too commercial. I think these surgeons are using it. I've been using it. I want you to hear from them and how they're doing it. But when you're looking at orthopedic AI power navigation system, you're really looking to provide high value and high performance. And I think I heard a lot of that from the conversation earlier. What is an ROI? Well, it, it, I'm glad to hear it was not just financial. It was also a, a surgeon satisfaction, patient satisfaction. And a lot of these things come into play. Ease of use is key. Can, I, can every single one of my surgeons use them? That's a consideration. Do, is it open platform? Can I use it with any implant? Is there an implant that fits best a patient other than another one? Is it invasive? Do I have to take trays and sterilize them and clog my uh, uh, central processing or not? Um, the other thing is if you have a fluoroscopy machine, you don't have to change it. You can just use that one right away. And the other piece is you may be able to use that technology in other areas and you don't have to buy another system for it. And we learned, I learned something else in 2017 at the Doc SF is that that technology has a duty to deliver on the value equation. And when we took that to heart when we actually built the systems because every feature and everywhere we were building it, we were looking at meeting that equation. So this slide is on white and I have no idea if this is gonna show up or not. But, oh yes, it does, great. Um, the clinical performance, um, proven techniques. Surgeons are already um, taking care of their uh, technique, and they don't want really to change it. Uh, they are creatures of habit. So if you can augment that, that technique, they'll get better with a system than trying to change completely what, you're, what they're used to do it. So ease of use is key, high adoption across not only um, uh, all the physicians, because it meets their technique, but it's also because it's self-guided, but it allows uh, the choice of implants if you want it, uh, want it as well. Non-invasive, uh, or time savings, uh, the amount of radiation and shock you're taking because of this is actually lowered. Uh, and then it, there's the upgrades. We upgrade everything. We're talking about subscription and models. Uh, we provide upgrades all the time. Last year, we launched this in May, and we already had three upgrades this, long, this year alone with uh, better uh, uh, performance. What about the cost? It's a low acquisition cost. No large capital. I think that's important. Uh, there's different flexibility on how you can acquire the technology. Increased volume actually increases the amount of discounts, so you pay less over time. Uh, and then you have the OR time efficiency, potentially. The staff burden is, uh, is reduced, minimal footprint. And if you want to do some marketing, you certainly can. Um, so what are some of the results for us? We already work in surgery centers. And uh, so far, as of April 1st, anybody who actually has tried it uh, has adopted it at, so, at some point. So it's very uh, encouraging to see the technology applying to uh, different um, techniques, needs uh, in the ASC hospitals and other areas, uh, and to be able to meet those needs. So if you have to consider a navigation system, I would, uh, just like selling the Atlantic, Focus on peace of mind, and AI can power that for you.
Thank you. So I, I don't know what happened to my slide deck, but. I, I apparently so Clarify is uh, supporting you and backing you up. <laughs> it's a big company. New <laughs> announcement. Well. Yeah, yeah, new announcement. Um, I'd be curious to see how that actually happened. Um, so, Edward, you've done, a, first of all, that, that video of your journey across the Atlantic, I think, got all of our attention. Well, that was, you told, you told uh, come up with a story that's different. So I just did that. <laughs> yes, you did, absolutely. And I think the idea of having the, uh, um, the, the, the cross-section of digital technology driving you and, and supporting you as you did, as you now have It would have been company. a totally different trip if we didn't have that. Yeah. Oh. As our, our, as our trips in the OR are without technology, there's, there's a question mark. I've definitely become a big fan of the robotic surgery. Everybody says it's because oh, it's the accuracy, but I love to know where the things are at the time that I put them in, and it's been, I've become a bit of a data junkie uh, using the robot, and because I don't do anterior surgery, that's why I don't I use that. the product. I know that, I know <laughs> uh, that. Uh, but uh, listen, um, what have you been, as you've gone through this journey of applying, of, of taking, um, uh, you know, uh, an existing technology, the, the C-Arm has been around for a long time, and trying to innovate around it, what were your big learnings about, uh, around, especially around adoption of new technology, new ideas? Well, so the hard part is C-Arm has been around for so long, it's a standard of care. Um, I, we felt that uh, it could be improved when we started understanding the capabilities of, of these type of technologies really early on. So when we looked at the field, uh, our experience with uh, navigation system and my team is, goes all the way back to the early 2000s. So when we looked that we couldn't move the C-arm out of the OR with like the regular optical tracking tools on the anterior hips, we kind of considered, okay, what can we do with this technology? And, it seems easier to uh, innovate on top of a standard of care than to try to create a new technology that's going to completely disrupt it. And I think you can see, for example, with the anterior approach, we started with the anterior approach because we had navigation posterior, then the C-arm came in when we flipped supine, and, uh, and that's kind of what brought this into play. So the, um, the floral market in the hip is 45% now because of the anterior approach. Mm -hmm. And so we just went with that wave and figured that if that worked, we should be able to provide better solutions to the physicians. Outstanding. 100% uh, retention rate of all your customers since the beginning is an yeah. extraordinary yes. feat. I don't know if it's going to track. I bet next month is going to be you know, lower. But uh, I, it's been a fantastic adoption. And I'm very thankful for the physicians who have you know, provided feedback as well. Outstanding. Thank you so much, Edouard. Yeah, fantastic. Um, coming up next, um, we have uh, a really interesting and compelling rethink of the way we interface in the operating room. When we heard yesterday uh, about, uh, about the use of computer vision in the AR from this company, from Derek Amatanula, who is a professor of orthopedic surgery at UCSF and the CEO and founder of this company. Uh, and I just want to give you a little additional uh, nugget about Derek. Um, he is beloved by his residents at Stanford. Now, up at UCSF, we think we're pretty much the mecca, but they think they're the mecca, and there's always a competition. But one of the most uh, relevant things you can do as a surgeon in an academic institution is to be a great teacher, and I know that to be true of Derek. So I wanted to mention that as a s somewhat disconnected, but definitely relevant point. Come on up to the stage. <clears throat> That's actually the highest compliment I think I can get as an educator. So I'm here to talk to you about the impact of computer vision in the surgery center. And I really want to talk to two of the, value, two of the really intricate value propositions that the surgery center brings, one, and, and maybe the places that it's falling down. One is in terms of inventory, and the other one is in terms of needed behavioral change. So we all don't dispute this, that the independent of procedure, if you don't need inpatient hospital services, your surgery is moving to an ambulatory surgery center. And that market by 2030 will be $15.3 billion. We're all on board with this trend. But there are other trends and forces that are inf influencing that despite growth. The CMS has basically demanded transparency, and this may not hit the ambulatory surgery center, but it is coming. In 2021, they mandated that basically you have a list of services in this and the items provided, and that is easily accessible, and that is only going to place increasing pressure on hospitals and ambulatory surgery centers to get really clear about their bottom line and the inventory that they use. So this is a common set of items used in a neurosurgical procedure. It's kind of like a pick list. 
And if I look at this as a surgeon and now someone trying to innovate in the ambulatory surgery space, I see three things in this list. One, there's a really big cost range between those items. And if I didn't have the list of costs, at the costs in the middle, I might not necessarily know the cost of something that's being offered to me as a surgeon. The other thing is this type of pick list lacks a ton of specificity. What's actually necessary for the surgery? What's sufficient to conduct that surgery safely? And how much of this is actually just the preference of someone that's sitting in the room? And if we're going to talk about preference, this, room ref this, this list also ref re reflects none of what changes as the procedure changes in time. So what, might, uh, what else might be needed as this involves? And if we talk about what else might be needed based on procedural necessity, I think we have to talk about unused items. It turns out in every single case, $700 of unused items are just tossed in the garbage. So why are they there? As a surgeon, I look at my staff and say, well, you, you opened the wrong thing. But actually, the staff is anticipating my needs. They're responding to my anxiety. And we have to really get down to brass tacks that we're part of that problem. So surgeons, because of culture, habit, anxiety, do a lot of things that disconnect them from the supply chain. If you look at that, if you survey surgeons on the exact same list in their costs, and there's many more items in there, only 77% of surgeons overestimate low-cost items, and they overestimate about 188%. 55% of surgeons underestimate high-cost items by over 30%. The key here is that awareness makes a difference. If you just show surgeons what their procedures cost compared to what their peers do, they automatically reduce their cost by 20% per case. 74% of surgeons in this particular study lowered their cost either by just changing their supplies and 37% changed their technique entirely. And at one year, 82% of, of surgeons were engaged. The key part here is this required zero incentivization, just transparency. So what we need is a simple way to engage surgeons in managing inventory to reduce costs inside surgery centers and in probably inside any sort of operative environment. This is the solution from my company utilizing computer vision. What we do is we take in information either so utilizing... So I'm Dr. Robert Maley from San Francisco, California. I've been in practice now just over 10 years. Interesting. So uh, take, in, uh, take in information either using a bar scanner, natural language processing, or computer vision. And we disambiguate what was needed from what was opened, from what was actually used in the surgery, and then what was opened over time in order to actually figure out and create a live pick list. So that process, we also introduce a digital whiteboard. And I want to highlight that introducing technology into the operating room can be used in a multiplexed fashion. Because we don't just want to change the behavior of surgeons related to their inventory. We also want to change the behavior of people in the operating room. So we replace a whiteboard where we keep track of sponges and gauze, and we get this digital interface where they can now count and do that process really simply. But this board then becomes flexible, and we can use this in a novel way. Turns out, transiting information in a surgical team utilizing your words turns out to be really inefficient and wastes a ton of time and has a lot of friction in the operating room. So if we just do the handoff between nurses when you have a shift change or between the scrub tech and the nurse non-verbally utilizing a digital interface, we can do processes easier. In fact, we can handle that communication by showing maybe what phase of surgery you're in and what the next steps are and what are the anticipated things. So we can use this very flexibly. How much time could we get for doing that? Where is that friction? Turns out we did a study, and it was published recently in JAMA Surgery, looking at turnover of team members in their communication. And when every time your circulating nurse or scrub technician turn over or change because they need a bathroom break or because they have a scheduled break, it costs you 20 minutes. So utilizing the flexibility of the space in order to deliver an inventory solution, we can save you 20 minutes every time a team member turns over. We can also continue to use this as an inventory-related tool. Everything that's scanned in, you can see the inventory, you can search for it. We can also begin to manage your trays and which trays are utilized and begin to, begin to assemble kind of the preferences of surgeons that are now held in sheets and make those alive. I'll give you an idea. This is basically the green dot, the, sorry, the blue dots are what was used in the surgery. The, the, the white ones were the ones that were requested, so we can begin to make comparisons. We can also communicate with SPD or supply chain in a totally different way by marking a particular item and showing that it's missing or broken. We can restore communication in a digital fashion across a broken aspect of, the sur of surgical care.
And then we could do what we actually want to do, which is look and calculate the actual cost of surgery and the inventory that was used, create a dashboard so that we can compare procedure to procedure, surgeon to surgeon, and actually get at that pick list that is necessary, sufficient, and determine what's actually preference. The surgeons have to be open to this, but of course, this could drive deep change inside of the inventory management within an ambulatory surgery center. But I don't think the impact of computer vision stops there. Actually, the most valuable thing in the room is not the items. We heard it today, it's the people and how those people conduct their work. We've installed large eight camera systems inside of hospitals, but we believe we can stream that line this back down to two, maybe even three cameras and begin to understand the work that occurs in this room to drive behavioral change. So what do I mean by that? We can actually track where people are, what, where their proximity is to the sterile field, which objects they deliver. And if you really think about surgery, surgery is actually the motion of objects by highly trained people to specific regions of interest. And if we understand that, that actual utilization, we actually understand the work that's occurring in this space. As we do that, we can begin to assemble basically an understanding of how to make cultural change possible. So we know lean management works. That's why the ambulatory surgery center works. We align people around culture. They do things in a certain manner. We reduce the friction inside of the system. It works. And we can maintain it in a surgery center. But how do we do that better? We get a, a Six Sigma process. We reevaluate it. We get some cultural change. We try and make the people move. And then we revert back to our old system. Unless you're measuring how the people are doing that, reinforcing that, and then we see later incentivizing it, you can't change it. We know there are huge gains there. We just don't have the tool to measure it and access it. Turnover times reduced by 43%, less overtime for your staff, and increasing margins is what everyone in this room wants. But if we don't begin to measure how the people are performing against our expectations, their own expectations, we can never make this different. We heard already that behavioral incentives work. I'll say that behavioral incentives always have a price. And so we need a system that studies the price as well as the benefit. And so we, we know that incentives in many systems will change. This is monetary incentives. Those incentives for that behavioral change don't have to be monetary. People want to work on winning teams, so assigning people to the right team is worth something to them. People want time off and time with their family. We heard that from both surgeons as well as team members. So all sorts of incentives could work in this particular environment and drive behavioral change as long as we show people. We heard from, I think, J.P. Warner or people who cited Peloton. People actually want to know their performance against other people. So as long as we begin to measure that, they will automatically improve. Just like when we had transparency with the surgeons, the surgeons automatically improved. That's, that's our nature when we're in this environment trying to help patients. So this is an example of a dashboard where we can identify outliers in terms of surgical time. We can drill in on those and look at how many sterile field violations, who's present in the room, what inventory was utilized, and we can begin to understand how these outliers drive our behaviors and how these behaviors are associated with increased cost. So with that, I will say thank you and, and, and really hope that you see that an objective video data pipeline evaluating the work, both the, inven the people and the inventory that are necessary to do the work, is the most critical thing to deliver on the value chain, increasing safety, reducing cost, and improving outcomes. Thank you. No, thank you, and uh, appreciate uh, all the speakers being on time, and we uh, guess right back on time, but I still want to keep you up here for a second. Sure. <laughs> so I think there's an extraordinary way to think about um, uh, the use, again, layering technology onto our workflows to improve them. It's been a bit of a theme. Uh, we clearly have a lot of opportunity, uh, and it's not by lack of effort. Um, as I was coming up with the idea of, um, of this conference and work focusing on uh, outpatient surgery, I spoke to a uh, director of an outpatient surgery site and said, and said I, I'm, we're super efficient, technology just gets in our way. Um, and she's actually not here, um, sort of speaks to itself. I think there's this mindset that there, there's no way, but there are patterns we can't see, right? That's the whole purpose of applying technology to these that is the whole purpose. I mean, there are patterns that we see really obviously. I didn't. I didn't. I showed it in that one. So there's a there's a nurse that walks by that table eight times, and she walks by that eight table time eight times and makes eight sterile field violations. It gets really close to the sterile field. In fact, the, the drapes even move. Nobody knows that that occurs. But the behavioral change, if you look at that, is actually move the table one foot over, right, and that the space is inadequate. So you, there are there are all sorts of these novel layered 
insights here. Another one is that cir uh, circulating nurses are really great in setup, and then they spend a lot of time standing around. Not, that's not their fault. They actually, if they did a great job, actually they should be standing around. They had everything you needed, everything was ready, and perhaps we should be repurposing or multitasking people to make things go faster. So I think you can <coughs> reconceive work in the environment. Just to say that it's efficient, I think that that means that you're meeting your bottom line, you're meeting your KPIs. But we saw surgery is a giant black box. We've optimized in the ASC the KPIs of in and out of the ambulatory surgery center in terms of nursing workflow, administrative workflow. But as surgeons, we really absolved ourselves of how to make that better, per se. And it really needs, we need to turn, a, turn an eye to our inventory and turn an eye to our teams about how to run them effectively. Yeah, I tell you, I, th that last point, turn an eye to our teams run effectively. I, I spent a lot of time at Casa Permanente, and I'll never forget uh, at one point I joined a team, the co company wasn't doing super well, and they started creating these data uh, feedback loops. And we spent a tremendous amount of time figuring out what data point would actually drive a bunch of different uh, um, uh, behaviors. By the time we got done with this process, this uh, circular feedback loop, the highest performing group, um, sorry, the lowest performing group in the whole system was performing at 2x the highest performing group at the beginning. It was all through data feedback loops. It wasn't particularly heavy handed in terms of what could can be done. It was just saying, look, these guys are doing it better or doing it differently and achieving these outcomes. What can you do and, we sh and share the information? Talk we, to me about that. We, I totally agree. So there, there are systems inside of, we talked to many of the ambulatory surgeons, they can do eight cases in a room. I can have an administrator go and visualize that room. I can bring my whole team and we can never reproduce it in another environment. What we need is a digital twist, an assembly of the steps that are done visually and digitally inside of that room and hand that to another team to be benchmarked and nudged in terms of their behavior to better performance. This is a cultural change engine. This is a way under which you transfer processes from one surgery to another. I'll give you, I'll give you another particular point. This is really hard to do because the person who's tracking your operative times and tracking the work is a nurse. They're conflicted and they have 4,000 other tasks. Unless you automate these tasks, you'll never have the resolution, the standard deviation of all these times and all these movements. This has to be done object objectively. It has to be done by a computer vision, non-surrogate, a machine learned model, or you'll never collect the data accurate enough to drive this change. And uh, I think we've made the point before, but it's, if you go in and install your system, by itself it's not gonna do anything, right? It has to be in the context of an entire uh, top-down decision. We're going to move this direction. Absolutely. All right. Thank you so much for joining us again. <laughs> Terrific conversation. <clears throat> so we're seeing a pattern. We're seeing how we can integrate these technologies into our workflows in ways, again, we could not do when we started this conference in 2017. Um, one of the pain points uh, that we've had um, as surgeons for a long time is, is surgical scheduling. And we have uh, here to talk to us a little bit about optimization of that process. Um, the, uh, the CEO of Docspera, so Vinit Agrawal. Where are you, Vinit? There he is, great. Uh, Vinit is uh, currently the chief growth officer at Docspera. He has 25 years. He doesn't look old enough to have 25 years of commercial experience uh, leadership uh, within the medical device and pharmaceutical uh, uh, industry. And his mission has been to expand access to novel medical technologies to patients and physicians worldwide. Please welcome to the stage, Vinit. <laughs> That goes for it, yeah, the green one. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Beanie. Wow, that was a great presentation, wasn't that? Uh, it was very uplifting, actually. I could think of a lot of things uh, not related to, hey, I'm going to be on the stage next time, uh, next. Uh, so uh, I don't know if you realize this. This is a fantastic week to be here. Uh, Dr. Beanie may have chosen this, and maybe he didn't know at the time. We're bookended by, uh, by an amazing event that's about to happen on Saturday. Anyone, anyone know what that is? It's the coronation, right? <laughs> it's a big deal for a lot of people. But uh, what it started with, so I, I did not have a story uh, to tell about crossing the Atlantic, and I was looking for how I would start this conversation. And I, I stumbled upon this story um, 30 years ago this week something called the World Wide Web was released into public domain. Anyone heard of this? Right. <laughs> but all of us have been beneficiaries of this. 
All of us here have been beneficiaries of this. I am old enough, I was a college student, a young, naive college student in 1993 when this was released. But I knew then that this was going to be something that will change the way we live our lives. I did not know how it would change in many different ways in which it has, and all of you are aware of this now. So the reason, uh, this talk is not about the World Wide Web. Um, the reason this appealed to me was because of the premise upon which the founders, the founding uh, researchers at CERN came up with the idea of the World Wide Web. If you take a look at this, their concept was almost everything which you needed to know in your daily life was written down somewhere, typically written down in a computer somewhere. If it could only be tied together and made accessible, everything would be so much easier for everybody. Can I drop the mic now? Does that resonate with anyone here? Dr. Beanie mentioned earlier, and it was actually very poignant, uh, perhaps more than uh, he thought it might have been, uh, motion. Human beings have not changed. Motion of human beings has not changed. Our template has not changed. I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna this is very, very broad, obviously, but I'm gonna relate this to my experience recently, uh, 30 years ago versus now, and getting a simple procedure at an outpatient surgery center. 30 years ago, I had to call, one, make one phone call. This time, I had to make three phone calls, uh, one to get a pre-auth, one to get an MRI, one to get et cetera, et cetera, but they were phone calls uh, interrupted by you know, some, some automated feature in the middle. Obviously, a, a lot of systems have changed. A lot of systems are new, a lot more systems. But from my experience as a patient, and from the experience of the person on the other side, did a lot dramatically change? And could a lot dramatically change? I ask you. I'll try to answer this in a more uh, uh, simplified fashion, even more simplified. So who was here for Dr. Warner's presentation earlier this morning? D D Dr. Ast asked him a very good question. What was the answer to, to the first question? Two words. This is Dr. Warner, who's a big deal. We all know. Inventory management. I lived this life, by the way. I'm going to tell you the story from a different way. Uh, three years ago, or at the height of the pandemic, I was managing uh, very, very intelligent people in Japan, New Zealand, Australia, Korea, who were essentially sitting by their phones, trying to figure out how to support the incredibly intelligent surgeons essentially by making their way to the dock. That was the life. You live this life, the surgical, the pre-surgical case coordination. We hear a lot of, hey, I've got 300 different things that I need to take care of. Can some of those, can any of those, can a few of those be automated? Just those redundant ones. This is one of those redundant ones. Seems simplistic. But it is something that, at least what we are told is, hey, you know what? This is not something I want to worry about. This is not something I want to cause the oh shit moment. There's no kids here, right? Everyone got the problem? So this is a solution. This is our solution. The concept is not to change the workflows, not to create any new technologies, use the existing technologies, use the existing workflows, all of these Everybody uses an EMR now. Everybody uses a PAC system. They can be connected seamlessly. And then you can deliver those information to the right stakeholders at the right time and automate based on some adaptive way to include the surgeon preferences, et cetera, et cetera. All the templating, everything can be automated. And then all the stakeholders are kind of seamlessly connected. Reasonably simple solution as well. I like simple solutions, by the way. Everybody here gets this, right? So this is us here. Um, uh, uh, and, and the two points that I want to make here, and, and I think Dr. Beanie has said this over and over again, one is the ecosystem that we live in, the surgeons, the surgeons and also the, the staff and the patient lives in, is, is, is not in any one setting. 
Uh, it's not in a private practice by itself. It's not in an outpatient center by itself. And it's not an inpatient center by itself. All of those need to be connected. And that is what our intent and goal is. That patient, that surgeon's traveling between that ecosystem, and we would like to coordinate seamlessly within that ecosystem. And the second thing, I, the point, the second point I want to make is automation is not automation if somebody else is doing the job of somebody that was previously being done by somebody else. Uh, we do, and, and we don't try to do everything, and I don't think anyone should try to do everything. Um, uh, uh, and, and, and as part of that, uh, we do try to automate all around us and all around each one of our uh, kind of partners, if you will. So, and, and, and for that, we use a lot of technology partners, some of whom are here today, actually. Um, and so, so this is obviously delivering benefits as well to the system. Uh, there was a point uh, the, the previous speaker made about incentives. Uh, I could not agree more. Uh, incentives uh, uh, work. Uh, incentives drive behavior. Uh, the two points I want to make here are, uh, while no individual or uh, while, while nobody here uh, may be impacted by all of these incentives, um, everyone here is impacted by an incentive. Um, and uh, what I am open to discussing is how do you get the decision maker, the user, and the person who's actually going to be impacted or who cares about the metric all in the same place. Uh, not all of that happens. I, I liken that to lining up ducks who are all swimming in different ponds. Um, I'm, I'm open to suggestions on that. Here's a quick video uh, from Dr. Robert Maley, who is here in the Bay Area, uh, Calpac or So I'm Dr. Robert Maley from San Francisco, California. I've been in practice now just over 10 years. Um, and focus mainly on hip and knee replacements. Things don't fall through the cracks like they could have in the past. Um, now all cases are, are planned uh, ahead of time. Uh, so we have a, a better idea of inventory that might be needed, of potential trays that might be uh, needed, you know, for example, hardware removal, or if it's a revision of some sort, you know, what type of implants um, are in there. It's a more seamless communication amongst the whole team. As, as soon as the case is planned through Docsfera, um, the sales associate can see it, I can see it, my PA can see it, the, the surgical site can see it. Um, so it, it saved us time in terms of pre-op planning, communication, and then also to anticipation of inventory needs. So this is the vision, right? This is the vision is to line up each one of these components so that that, surgeon, that, that patient's journey and, and so too the surgeon's journey can, many components of that can be automated. Um, and you can see a lot of opportunities here, I'm sure, and, 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 and Dr. Beanie's done a fantastic job of kind of pulling a lot of these pieces together. So hopefully this is the point we'll get to in the future. Final we, words from Dr. We Sally. may never bump against the threshold of resource utilization and resource shortages, and, and, and we hope that we don't, but because that risk is always there, I think we constantly have to be ready to reshuffle, reorganize, and be prepared to move uh, large volumes of patients on a moment's notice. It's, um, it's a big deal. And with the limited staff that we have right now, um, any way we can automate that would be huge. That, that, that last uh, quote that he just said is actually what wakes me up every single morning, any way that you can automate that. Um, and, and, but what I'm going to leave you with is this. Uh, uh, th this, is, this is what I think, what we think is, is needed. Automation needed by data, removal of redundant processes are the precursors to enabling the power of AI. Um, I really appreciate it and thank you for your time. Excellent. Thank you uh, for showing us that, that perspective. And, um, as I was listening, um, the integration with the EMR piece is a piece that you didn't quite mention, because that's a big part of what you can do. Uh, where, are we, where are we with that now that we have, um, I mean, just clarified for everybody that it can be done? It, it can absolutely be done. It's very possible. We've spent the last eight years working. There's now, what, I think over 60 different EMRs. So that's- 259. Last Two, 259, okay. So, so e each one has a different mechanism, uh, a different way that they keep their data. That's the challenge, how to tokenize that, uh, that, that data, and then how do, you, how, do you, uh, how do you match that with the imaging as well? So w but we've spent a lot of time and effort on it. It's, it's something I think we do well, um, and, and I think it's something that hopefully will take us to 
this next level. Yeah, and also uh, just a little, uh, we actually have are fortunate enough to use your, your product at UCSF, and one of the things that we just learned that we can actually use it for research. It's actually a really interesting, uh, hadn't thought about concept about how to use some of these data sets and how to find patients and track them as well. So thank you so much for coming and joining us today. Thank you, Dr. Thank you for that.